Whether you're a Class 5 rafter or just looking for a couple of laughs, these two have you covered. Welcome to Aaron and Zach's Better Than Mediocre Rafting Show. What do you think? Whose voice is that? That's amazing. We went to Fiverr and hired somebody. He's like that guy who does announcements, so does announcing things. And so we oh, just really? hired it out. Oh, that was hilarious. Oh, my God. Yeah, there's some really good scenes of like almost rapping. I like that. Yeah, I like the yeah. footage in there. That's really fun. It was yeah, fun putting yeah. it together. Yeah, that's hilarious. Oh, God, that was a good laugh, man. Um, <laughs> well, go ahead. You want to welcome everyone? And yeah, well, yeah, everyone. Welcome to uh, Aaron and Zach's Better Than Mediocre video review show, where we think we're actually better than mediocre, and we talk about rafting. We usually review videos, but this week we kind of have a topic of discussion we're going to go over. And before we get started, if you're watching, please think about hitting the like button. It helps other people see it, subscribe, do all the things. And I just added this new thing in YouTube called memberships. And so it's a new way to um, get money basically <laughs> from YouTube. <laughs> and so for you, if you watch the show and you like it, you can be a member for a buck 99 a month. I think that's what it is. You just hit there somewhere. There's like a join button at the bottom of this. And um, yeah, you get like a little icon next to your name when you comment. It's kind of cool. It's something new that I'm trying out. Um, and uh, this isn't my job. So like, I don't need to make money off of this. But when we get money from it, we can certainly use it to buy more equipment to talk about or just like I can be get better at camera gear. Maybe we can get uh, Aaron a microphone someday and, you Ooh. know, a different hat. Although it's that outfit is a different hat. It's a different hat. I, I've, I've switched up my hats after those yeah, comments. About yeah, it's almost like we made hat. money. Yeah. No. Yeah, you look <laughs> pretty, pretty svelte today, Aaron. That's a whole nice outfit. So um, something I thought I'd try. So if you want to be a member, it's like I said, you just click join like 99 a month kind of a cool new thing we're trying out and don't don't feel any pressure too because like i said i have a job so i don't you know we don't have to basically have you money. got money you don't know what to do with here's something you can do with it yeah and feel yeah. good about it support the yeah, show you want to tip the show tip us a little bit here's some here's some cash and we'll uh and you'll get like a little icon next to your name and and that some other cool stuff someday so uh oh cool yeah thanks for applying brent hopefully you're good <laughs> do I know Brian? I'm not sure I know you, but we're we are looking for good guides. So uh yeah. Yeah, Brandon, make sure you've watched his little video on how to apply for a job because if you don't yeah. check all his little boxes, he's probably not gonna call you back. Well, I did a new video yesterday on how to apply. <laughs> not how to apply, but like what we're looking for. And I re record it took me like 50 takes because I you know I can do a gear garage on one or two takes. But oh Dougie's here. Uh welcome, Dougie. We're joining having Dougie join the show. Nice. How's it going? It's good. Good. good Welcome. To see you, Eric. Hey, Doug. And you know, I I recorded the video, and I was pretty harsh on. I, I went on kind of a rant in my video about uh, not wanting guides who are alcoholics. You know, like if your main goal in guiding is to just drink <laughs> and party, don't even bother applying because that's not what we're about. Like, like we do. Our guides do drink beer. It's not like we're total fuddy duddies and we're like, you know, don't party. But like. It, we're not like a partying company. What do you guys think about that? Is that something to be upfront about? Am I over the top? Like, any thoughts? You want to know my real thoughts? Yeah, tell me. I think my real thoughts is Zach's like, oh, yeah, we're not a party company. And all your employees go, oh, yeah, sure, Zach. And then as soon as Zach's gone, it's woo! Let's break out the beers and let's get going. No. It's like, mom, it's like you know, your parents. When your parents all thought you, all, you never did anything wrong. You're a kid. You always did everything right. And then when they're not around, or maybe your friend, you have friends like that who are the, what was the Leave it to Beaver guy? They yeah. Do, um, Eddie, Eddie Haskell. Bunch of Eddie Haskells. Aaron, I think you think that because that's how you are. You oh, know, yeah. You tell all the people for like, oh, I'm, I'm Aaron. I don't drink. I'm super healthy. And then on the river, you party down. Yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah. Zach, we're, would you we're, say that that's pretty different from other companies? Do you think any other companies say something like that? I don't know. I think, I think a lot so. of I think a lot of them say stuff like that. Yeah. But then you go no. out there and then the owner is getting hammered and you're just like, wait, what? You know, I yeah. feel like that happens a lot too. I've seen a lot of that over the years with different outfitters. We're like, oh yeah, we have these policies. Like this one guy right now is, you know, like, oh, the not drink or have sex on trips type of thing. And then you yeah, then you see someone who's like 
owner of a company doing those things. And you're just like, okay, is this really what's going on here? So <clears throat> it comes, it comes from the top for sure. So like, you know, if the owner's drinking it, like we, like I'm sure every company says like, Hey guys, don't drink, be responsible. Don't do drugs. Um, the, the sex thing is interesting. Like, don't ever have sex or just on trips. Like that's, I'm not sure what that means, but you have to be oh, celibate. Do you celibate? Yeah. Although I, I remember you were for a company, Aaron, where you're, you had yeah, to yeah, we, we, we call it celibate river trips. Yeah. Like that, yeah you, so. <laughs> that was an interesting setup, Yeah, but I think, um, like it's important to me and I think our guides are pretty like, there's a fine line, right? There's like the partying scene where drinking is a part of the trip and like guys drink a lot every night. And then there's like the casual glass of wine here and there having a beer once in a while. There's definitely a line between like being responsible with it and the culture that's really bad. And I think that that can come from the top. I think you're right, Aaron, like the owner or the managers, if they say don't drink and they go on a trip and get drunk five nights in a row, that's just, it's just lip service. So I think it has to like, you know, it has to be demonstrated by the people up top um, correctly. Man, there's a bunch of things here. These. Oh, sweet. Awesome. Yeah, Brandon, that's good to hear. Um, juice. Yeah. Who do you guys know what juice is? Speaking of drinking no. on the river, <sighs> Mark, um, it's this drink that they have in, in, you can get it in like small towns. It's, it's like 35% poison. Like if you, it's, it's a can, if you drink one, uh, it'll, it's fun. Like you'll, everybody's, everybody will be in a mood, but you'll ruin your next day. You basically ruin the next day of your life. So it's, 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 wait, it's so wait, what is this product? It's poison. You said it's called juice. And it's like, I think it's partly poison. It's a dollar 99 for like a 20 ounce can. It's awful. Um, Burnett, there are six rivers. They worked on the two the most party river, but yeah, I was working for, all right. River. There were six rivers. They worked on two. I'm not sure what that, I'm not, I don't understand that. All right. It sounds like two of the six were known as the ones you go to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So we got juice. <laughs> juice is the first premium malt beverage at 9.9%. Bring, bring it up, Aaron. Aaron, bring it up. We're not promoting drinking, by the way. Like, this is all about, like, not having guys who drink. But this stuff is terrible. Oh, yeah. Okay. But Mark Rivers, comma, DP, comma, PT, Come a badass, did a couple of trips with us and probably had a juice at the guide house. There it is. There's juice right uh, there. I mean, it's yeah. not not super exciting, but there it is. Yeah, definitely clear. something to avoid drinking. It's <laughs> it's it's really fun if everybody drinks a juice and you're hanging out, but they, it it's not good for you in every way well, possible, and yeah. it ruins your next day. It's fourteen percent. They have up to fourteen percent. Cans are fourteen percent. But the forty yeah, percent yeah. can is only a twenty three point five ounce can versus the nine point nine percent is a twenty four ounce can. So they won't give you a twenty four ounce can in fourteen percent. It's thirty five percent poison. I can tell you that. <laughs> like it's really not good stuff. Um, oh, Brandon, that's awesome. I'd love to actually. I'd love to to read about it because it's a problem. It's not just, but it's not just in the commercial. It's the whitewater community. So like, I'm looking for guides because there's a lot of guides out there who associate guiding or drinking like the reason they do it the reason they're in the, they love it is because they want to party and have fun and like that's almost why they do it is to be around other people that want to party and it's not good and i think that i see a lot of private boaters too like if drinking wasn't part of boating they probably wouldn't vote right i don't know people like that actually yeah but uh, you don't i don't i don't think so I mean, Dougie, you're a Knowles guy. Knowles people are more responsible in general. <laughs> I'm um, going to say this. I feel like there's a lot of, I know a fair number of guides who I think continue to guide because it's alcoholic friendly, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and they're, they're able to be an alcoholic and it's not, it's not like frowned upon. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's a support, it's a supportive environment for alcoholics. If you would say that in a weird way, in, in a bad way, I think, but. You know, I mean, that's why there's group. There are groups like the Will Foundation down in Grand Canyon, and what's the one? You wouldn't bike on the one in, in Idaho, um, Zach. Redside Foundation. Redside Foundation. There are those. There are those organizations that are trying to help the guides mm -hmm. and people in the community. So it is a problem. Yeah, it is. 
Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I was no angel in my youth, as you two know. Like, it's, <laughs> I, it's hard to preach this when I wasn't perfect myself. Uh, but, but having been through that process and recognizing what the system of guiding does to <clears throat> me, and I watch other people go through it, they come in young, innocent people who love rivers, and they leave kind of alcoholics. Hmm. And, you know, they, they, the seasonal aspect of guiding, you go from guiding to some ski job that also we're drinking can be a problem. It just becomes a year-round thing. And so, Aaron, do you say it's a supportive, hard. like multi-days are supportive, or, mm -hmm. or both? Day? I think Mondays and multi-days, both. I think scenes. hanging I think out, having a beer, the worse. Hmm. I mean, going to the yeah. bar every night. I talked to guides who, yeah, but then the like I've, I've been on trips where every night we're having cocktails. Somebody's somebody's bringing out a, a handle yeah. of something, and it's gone at the end of the night. You know, and everyone brings in everyone, each of the guides brings a handle for one night and then they're like, they're, they're consuming it. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, yeah, I think you're right about the one days have a problem too, but like, yeah, yeah they're both, I, I feel like. I mean, like it, I haven't both. guided one days for a long time, but I hear now about that the Coloma club on the South Fork <laughs> or like what's happening in the Arkansas for some companies just every night hitting a hard, cause there's a bar, you just go to the bar, you know, and I, I get that everybody, you know, on multi-day trips can do it too, but. I don't know. Do you? Th but then the other part is like, do you think this is really that much more than like, you know, you go to your whatever nine to five job, and then they're going to down to the bar afterwards and getting hammered yeah. too? I mean, every night there's probably the yeah. same things. I, I wonder if it's actually more of a problem in the boating computer. Just like we, it's more noticeable because we're together. Like we kind of live together, so you see people's lives. What happens when they go home? Because you don't really go home versus other jobs. No, it's worse than other jobs. Do. Because in guiding, you get to camp at like four, people pop open a beer, and then it just goes. I mean, in people's real lives, if they drink a lot, they like have to at least go home, change, and then go to a bar. You know, like I think, yeah, and I think it's supported. If everybody's doing it, there's almost peer pressure to do it. Have either of you seen an owner, or Zach, have you as an owner, approached any guide and said, do you want some help with beating this thing? Yeah. Or I've noticed this, do you want... Do you want to talk about it? Yeah. I have a problem. And, and how did that go over, Zach? Not well. It doesn't go over well. No. They like don't we think there's a no problem. We like, they can people. be drunk and they can tell me, oh, I don't have a problem. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I mean, you're drunk right now. It's three. But, you know, I mean, Andrew has a good comment here. There's a minimum blood alcohol content for running whitewater. I think in private boating, it's maybe worse. Because at least commercial guiding, you don't start drinking. You don't drink during the day. Like you see a lot of private boaters with a beer in their hand at 10 a.m. Yeah, but I think there's a big difference, Zach. Is the private boating they're on vacation? It's not yeah. their daily not life. All summer long. Yeah, they're not doing it every but day. But it's still a problem. Long. It's still a problem. Uh, is is it? You don't want people. I mean, don't you go? Don't know a bunch of people go down to like let's go to Baja and go hang out at the beach or the Caribbean or go, you know? Yeah, but that's a at a, a resort, not on the whitewater. You're like saying it's a safety issue as opposed to an alcoholic issue, Zach. Yeah. You're yeah. concerned about the safety. Okay, the safety side, I'll be able, I'll give a little bit of that. But, but really, here, is it but really a safety people, issue on like Desolation Canyon? I mean, maybe it's a dehydration issue there or something like that. But it's always a safety issue on Whitewater, I think. Like no matter if it's class one. Come but, on. I'm gonna I'm I'm taking those out because I'm gonna say it's like I've seen so many guys that are so bad that I don't think them being hammered is gonna make a difference. It does. It does. Now it's, I, I, it's definitely a safety issue in camp as well. I mean, it could be yeah. around the kitchen, um, around the river, peeing in the middle of the night, stuff like that. It has had accidents. I mean, there's definitely been accidents. Yeah, people have accidents at home where they slip on the shower. Oh, you know, the you know, shower is dangerous too. Go for a kid up in the middle of the night, go for a pee, and they trip over their kid's toy. You know, I mean, like walking down the stairs. You know, like like. But I you mean, don't. If you're drunk at home, you're not going to fall in the river. And there's 911. Well, there's 911. There's no one. You can still fall down the stairs. That's a, that's and there's a, that's a huge tumble. But, uh, you know, uh, on the river, I think I think we need to make on the river that drinking is not a valid thing. And, and again, I'm not an angel here. So, like, I'm, yeah. it's like it's hard for me to preach this. Wait, I mean, wait, 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 wait. What did you say? <laughs> drinking on the river, it should not be okay. It should not be okay. Okay, Zach yeah. Collier, drinking on the hey. river, not okay. Well, Aaron. <laughs> And then Zach, I, think, I admit i'm not an angel i have not been perfect in this regard <laughs> okay and i just want to like as we have this conversation i'm gonna be i'm gonna let everyone know it's been over two years since i've had any alcohol in my system so it's kind of funny that i'm taking the side on this but... <laughs> yeah. and zach i think um 
the culture you're talking about is is awesome. Like what the way you set it up when you hire somebody and the culture you're trying to set. And that's a huge piece of it. Um, and then having policies is a whole different issue that maybe you don't even have to go there. But um, but that's that's another direction to go in is having actual policies that you can say to somebody, this is why I'm talking to you right now about how drunk you are at three o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, we have, I haven't had this talk in a long time. Mm -hmm. It's been a while. And I think our culture has changed a lot. And it's me having to be, I've had to be, uh, I don't know what the word is. I've had to work hard to, to change the culture and create an environment where like it's more about health and less about drinking. And it's not that there's no drinking. Like, you know, we're not, you know, people have a beer here and there and like it's normal. But it, like you go to some guy's houses, you know, there's a bong on the table. There's like, you know, <laughs> everybody's drinking cocktails and it's out of control. You guys know this, but there's two things right about commercial and, and private. And I want to get back to like, like having a beer at 10 a.m. on a river trip. Ah, that's a bit excessive to me, and that's just my opinion. Like 10 a.m. and we see it what all about, the time. What about a little, a little pour, a little, a little something, something in your morning coffee? Additive. Yeah. I mean, you mean like fuel. Bailey's or, or whatever? Yeah, I mean, people do that all the time on private. I mean, where, where do you? I know, where I, do you I know the commercial line? guys who do that. Every day, I'm not. I don't agree with it at all. No, but... I've heard about commercial guides recently doing some pretty crazy stuff. Actually, <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna make a poll right now for everybody to do because we gotta move on. We have stuff to talk about. Um, drinking on the river. Do you? Uh, we're losing. We're losing view viewership with this conversation. Like, <laughs> what? I don't know how to get on this. Suck. <laughs> this is probably my fault. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm making a poll right now. Boom, poll done. <laughs> so let's get to some comments. Um, Rochester was pretty bad to support what Aaron was saying. What does that mean? Was that the, the town's bad, just like everyone in general, or is it the rafting industry there? Is there? I don't think there's rafting industry. Gloucester's on the on the ocean. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I the golly thing is we could go into, but we're not going to. It's pretty crazy. I think having a couple IPAs is kind of delightful. You know, like having an IPA here and there, and then there's just shotgun. There's the isn't whole shotgun and beers that? doing shots. Isn't the alcohol content of IPAs way higher? Yeah, but if you have two over like four hours, it's a lot yeah, different. Than having... Yeah, but I think a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I'm drinking that. I'm just, I'm just enjoying my beer. But they're having a few of them versus like, you know, the Coors Light drinking party where they're like, yeah, I'm drinking. Yeah, they drink, oh, you drink a six pack. They're like, yeah, well, it's Coors Light. I mean, Like you, Aaron, I'm not much of a drinker. I drink more than you, but sounds like, but not. I, I, <laughs> actually, like I realize, I realize average, yeah, I realize it's actually night. been over three years, not two years. So yeah. I'm, yeah, I've, I'm over three years at this point. So um, I think, yeah. I think uh, Robert um, makes a good point, but what happens is some people are really responsible. They can have a beer at 10 a.m. and they can like pace themselves, have one at three, then have maybe one at camp and a you know, cocktail and it's fine. But they, other people see that they can't handle it. So if somebody sees yeah. that and they have the beer at 10, then the beer at 11, then the beer at one, then their cocktail at three, four, five, and six. Oh, come on. What's the point of drinking a beer at 10 if you're not getting a little buzzed? I mean, like, that's the whole point, right? Is it that good? I mean, why don't you I just drink some non-alcoholic? If you want just the, you're drinking it just for the taste, then drink non-alcoholic. Like, you're drinking it to get a little, a little funny. You know, you're yeah. drinking to get a little things, like, tipsy. People can do it. Like, people, like, the people that are good at it, and I shouldn't, I'm using good at it's the Whoa. wrong term, but Whoa. the people that... <laughs> the people that like they can are doing it it's not even responsibly like like as responsible as can be done sp are responsible how they spread it out but they're setting yeah. an example for other boaters Aaron, who I, look up to them Aaron, well, I would say they, some, they pound them i would say there's some people that drink it for the taste like they don't i i don't think i get buzzed off of one beer I mean, unless it's strong, but then why I, are you I, drinking the beer? Because you, your body wants alcohol. You're like, ooh, alcohol. Yes, that's what my body needs. That's why we like it. There's an addiction yeah, aspect. I, just, of I don't it. know if it's like smoking it, a cigarette, right? There is an addiction aspect to it for sure. There is, yeah. But somebody that is on a private trip, say they're not a drinker, they're not a drinker at home all the time or anything. They just have a. I don't know why they'd have a beer at 10 a.m. But if they did, if they other, wanted, because, because other people want to get a little loose. You because other be people are. Because it from one beer, though, I don't think you get loose. Then why do it? Then it makes no sense to me. Drink some water. I mean, I think to Zach's point, maybe because it looks cool. And it's culturally it. cool. It's way, Aaron, it's way cooler to have a beard in your hand. It's not, okay, I shouldn't say that. And look, it's it's the image. It's not actually cooler. It The image is that you're you, cool to you, have a beard in your hand feel versus cool. a water bottle. 
Yeah, you feel cooler drinking your you ice feel cold cooler beer. And you fit yeah. in. Like if like all the cool people have an IPA in their hand at 10 a.m. and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna drink some of some uh, La Croix, it's harder to fit in. Like there's a there's a peer pressure aspect. La Croix is better than beer, too. That's the funny thing. It tastes better. <laughs> I, was, I, I actually been drinking a lot of La Croix because it helped. I, I have a habit of grabbing a can of something and drinking it. It's not just yeah. it's not the beer, it's the habit I've created over my whole mm -hmm. life. And and Brody told me this summer that La Croix lowers my testosterone. So I've been <laughs> I'm like uh, every time I grab one, I'm like, here goes my testosterone. Uh, well, I heard oatmeal raises it. So just eat some oatmeal every day and you can counter it and keep okay. drinking your La Croix. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Peter, yeah. by the way, we have that video you sent us. Uh, I have it queued up. Uh, and we're going to get to it. I'm, I apologize. I think I lost my email. And Peter, thanks for sending that. No, I, I'm going to get the R1 stuff. We'll, we'll do it next week, I think. Okay, let's um, look at Denise. What? Come, Denise, we were running so hard, Lily. We never drank even off the river. I don't know. I heard stories. I know oh. guys from the 70s. Well, hold on, hold on. I think the 70s and early 80s, maybe not. But the 80s, they threw down. <laughs> I, I know those people. I was just at a party with those people actually last week. A lot of the 80s guides and all they could talk about was all their drinking stories. Yeah, maybe I don't I don't know if they were drinking on the water. I think they were they're like gripped enough that they were Yeah, no, I think in camp. Water. I think it's in camp. They're like yeah, camping. Yeah. You know, lots of stories of of handles of Jack Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I just I feel like drinking non-alcoholic beer is like drinking La Croix. You just it's hard, you want to fit in. If people are like, oh, that's a, you know, I, it's called. I mean, maybe I'm people just, don't know. As someone who doesn't drink on trips anymore, I think the La Croix is a really yeah. good option because like the people get weird about you not drinking. Like they get uncomfortable with like you're making some judgment on them. It gets it gets interesting being the non drinker Everyone's also like they're all like upset with you because they're like wanting you to support their drinking habit, which yeah. is really interesting. And you're like, dude, I just, you know, I just, I can't, I'm, I can't drink. So that's, it's just not an option for me. And, uh, hold on. Check out Denise's yeah. latest comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Maybe you, yeah. yeah. All right, let's move on. That's enough. Yeah. This will come up again in, in our topic of the day. And we have a couple of things to do today. Uh, one of them is, is going through the whitewater mm -hmm. skills checklist that I, I've come up with. And then number two is uh, we have some video to review at the end. And I want to give some background to this. Uh, we teach a lot of whitewater courses and I, I like one pagers. I like things that are one page, any more than one page. I feel like it's too much information for people. So this is for <laughs> us, our entire rowing curriculum on a page. I mean, and, and so there's more to it. Of course, there's more to teaching than just the words in this page. But I'm trying to keep the, the, the foundation of our whole rowing school curriculum. If I'm putting on one page, this is it. And it's, it's built as a checklist of things you should learn by the type of water you want to run uh, as a boater. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. And I know people that say, well, you got to add this. Remember, every time you add something, it takes something away to keep it a page. Like if this was complete, it would be, you know, 50, hundred pages, but in an effort to simplify it, um, I've sort of created this and broke it down into like, um, a checklist. And when we teach private classes to people, we have people check off the things that they know and that lets, or the fields, things they feel comfortable with. And that lets us know what we need to work on. So I thought we'd go through these things. Um, Aaron, do you want to read them? We're talking about uh, we can talk about them. I, I think before we go into it too, just, just a little bit, like one of the reasons we're bringing this up is Zach and I were having a conversation about like making that jump from running class three to class four and, and like what skills do you need for class four from class three? And, and we, and we, we, we talked about this checklist, how it's, it's kind of a good, it, I think this checklist is great for people who are, who are aspiring to run harder water, just be like, Oh, Hey, these are, so these are the, some of the skills I need to work on right now in class three and make sure I have so I can go run my class four. Because, I mean, I think that class two to class three bump, I think most people can do that. I mean, I, maybe you guys disagree with me on that and I'd love to hear your thoughts. But the class three to four, I feel like a lot of people kind of eddy out in class three and, and the step up to class four is a challenging step up. So and then whatever, class five is a whole different can of worms. So, yeah. 
If, and and you'll see a lot. This is these are soft <laughs> skills on here. This is this is this isn't like can you go by a rock and ferry over here that much. It's like what are the base set of soft skills you have and and training and safety skills and physical fitness skills to move on. So it's it's um what I think of as like things you need to learn to practice before you move on. And it's mindset. A lot of it's mindset. Okay. So yeah, we can, I mean, we want to just go through the class two boater stuff pretty quickly here. Um, able to row on flat water and paddle on flat water. That's just technical. You can technically move the oars. That's basically what it is. Like, you know, the basic strokes. Yeah. You can turn the boat, you can go forward, you can go back, you can yeah. yep. move oars in your hands. Pretty much anybody can do this. <laughs> Can float in a defensive swimmer's position. Okay. And then when you say can read obstacles, you're talking about like strainers, hole, like that. What do you mean by obstacles? Like rocks, things in the way. So like you can look downstream. This is reading water at the most basic level. Like you can look downstream and see a rock and know to avoid that. You can look downstream and see like a log. and know that's really bad. But you can see things in your field of vision. So it's like, again, most anybody can do this without learning it. But if you can't look downstream and see things, you can't read obstacles. Okay. This is a very, class two is a very, very, very basic level. Understand the danger of strainers and man-made objects. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory there. Understand the danger of foot entrapments, how to avoid. Yeah. Do not boat alone. Hmm. And we have a lot of people come to us for training the boat by themselves. Like, oh, I always go by myself. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I'm not going to approve of that. And I, I'm so you don't pass my class two boater skill set. So I'm not going to, like, they're like, I want you to check me off to do class four. And I'm like, well, if you go by yourself, I don't even approve you for class two. So I, that's just, that's a personal opinion of mine that people shouldn't boat alone. Hmm. Hey, Dougie, do you boat alone? I have, I think, three or four times in my life. Um, Zach, do you consider boating alone one boat or is it one person? I consider it both of those. One boat's boating alone. Because if you swim, you have nobody to, no other boat to help you. Like having two people in a boat is almost more dangerous than one, right? If, if, if you're in a boat by yourself and it flips, you can swim to shore and you're saved. If, you're, if there's two people in the boat, that's two people that are now victims with no downstream safety. If there's three people in the boat, that's three victims with no downstream safety. So you think it's safer for you to row a boat by yourself than the two of us are too? Yeah. Cause I'm a better rower than we are our tours. <laughs> I, I disagree with that. I, yeah. Go ahead, Doug. Do you have some well, I, Aaron, you asked that question. I would change what my answer is. Cause it really on class three and four, I've only boat a few times in my own, but class two, I would definitely boat by myself. And I, I guess I'm including, like I'm thinking of, um, canoeing and kayaking and stuff like that. Like you definitely go out by yourself and do some of that on class two. And See, I think I, the reason this is big to me, look at the American whitewater accident database. Just look at it sometime. You'll see yeah, a lot of solo I, boating accidents. Like most, yeah. a lot of fatalities. But isn't, I mean, but isn't the same thing. This is my, this is where I'm going back to. Isn't the same as swimming alone. Like you don't go swim in a pool by yourself. Cause you never know how many you slip and fall and hit your head on the side of the pool. Yeah. Right. I mean, I went mountain, I go mountain biking by myself all the time. I could crash and hit my head and die. Like, right. But I think mountain biking is a little different. You know, like I don't, I got, I walk by myself alone. I could slip and fall and hit my head. I think yeah. boating because of the current and the, the water and how it can like take your energy away and you can drown in water. I think it's a little bit more um, like, like speed of rescue <laughs> is a little bit more of a big deal than walking or, mountain biking and uh, and mountain biking alone is not a good idea i'm not i probably if i was teaching mountain biking i probably wouldn't stress i'd probably urge people to go with friends but for boating but i don't have data for mountain biking saying that like people are dying mountain biking biking alone there's data for boaters dying when they're boating one boat trips all the time my my concern is is like i hit my head or something and i go unconscious i need someone else there to help me and that's why yeah. I feel safe. That's why I would see, feel safe for R2 and with you, Zach, than rowing a boat. Like oh, myself. yes. Because if like I hit, if you hit your head. We're both not going to knock ourselves unconscious in the same round yeah. at the same I mean, time. That's just not going to happen. The examples I have in my head of fatalities are a boat flips and the people just go. Mm -hmm. Like when you read the accident reports, it's like a boat flips in swift water 
and the swimmers are just gone. There's no safety and they die. And nobody knows how they died because they just went. And, and so the more people like, I'm not worried about hitting my head and dying. Cause it, there's not a whole lot of data saying that people are dying from head injuries. There is a lot of data saying people are boating when they're by themselves. Well, that sounds like that's high volume where there aren't eddies and there's not pools at the bottom. It's generally when it's continuous. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, so it sounds like if it's pool drop, you, you, there's not much of a worry. So you're saying you okay? Don't bar alone and let's pull a drop. That's where I should make this. Second. Well, I no, it's kind of interesting. Is I always I, I when I'm thinking about this boating in one boat trip, it's always a low volume trip. I never would boat high volume one boat trip. Yeah, but that's no. Aaron. That's because you have you have yeah. a very good understanding of what the risks are <clears throat> because you've boated a lot. But people that are new to boating yeah. have zero ideas and can't make that judgment call. Like, oh, it's low volume. I'll just like walk on shore, and so this. You know, again, this is a one pager. So, so yeah, yeah, keeping it yeah. simple, like I'm going to say, don't bar alone. Now, people tell me, hey, uh, let's see, like, like Nick even writes, there's no explanation. Yeah, of course, there's not because it's one page. Yeah. If you want the longer explanation, I'll give you the 60 page document. This no, is no, my I, attempt to get it down to one page. I think it's exactly, it's good. The do not bar alone is good. I'm not trying to disagree with it. I'm just trying to get the nuances and have people think a little bit about what that means. Because also, maybe they've seen you boat by yourself before. People be like, oh, there's Zach out kayaking by himself today, or so. who knows? Hey, when I when I am boating by myself, I'm a ninja. Nobody ever sees it, and I don't, I don't, and that, that I will admit, I even though I say don't boat alone, I will do it occasionally under the right circumstances. But I understand the additional risks that I'm taking, and I shouldn't be doing it. And I'm, I don't brag about it. I'm not telling the world, hey, guess what? I just did a solo lap down the blah blah blah. I did it for me to have some sort of like experience i can only have like i need that time alone solo blah 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 so i mean i'm, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite here because i teach you not to do say, it you can say it able solo. to explain decision making around boating alone or has judgment around boating alone no i think do yeah, not yeah, yeah. i think i think do not boat alone is perfect for <laughs> that goes in the 50 should page not be batting alone if you're a class two boater no you shouldn't boat, boat alone yeah no Yep. You don't, okay. you don't have the, uh, okay. If you're, yeah. I, I okay, let's go to the next one. No okay. drinking water, huh, Zach? What's the deal with that? You don't want him to stay hydrated? Hold on. Go back. Next comment. I, I just disagree. Like mountain biking alone is not as dangerous as rafting, but I'm not doing jumps. I'm not like going super fast. I'm it's like going for a run. So it's like mountain biking <laughs> isn't always like super, it isn't always Red Bull rampage. Sometimes it's just going on a trail, enjoying time to yourself. So that, that's, that's my opinion. I could be wrong. We, all right. Yeah, do you want to do comments or go to drinking? Let's let's go. Let's keep doing the content because there's a bunch of them. Mountain <laughs> biking, you stop going downhill and you crash. Yep, exactly. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So like, if I crash, I'm just there on the ground, yeah. and I have, have a broken neck, and somebody's gonna find me eventually. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna go mountain biking alone somewhere where I don't. There's nobody at all, right? Like that would be a little bit insane. Um, but uh, because then if I crash, nobody would be there to find me. But like. We're, we're rafting all afloat downstream. Uh, that's the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I I I, in, I agree in some ways and disagree in others. And I'll say, yeah, like particularly low volume in the summer. Having said that, I remember high water, like I don't remember was ninety seven, and we were at the bottom of Meat Grinder. We were just pulling out the eddy, and we see these boats float, floating down upside down, like three of them in a row. And if we left. 20 seconds or we've been in that idiot a long time there would have been no one downstream and those people and the people couldn't swim them so we had to rescue them so even on the south fork where there's a lot of people when the volume gets high i think you still have that same risk yeah so but know, i high, think high that's volume. a good point like when it's summer yeah. and it's like 1200 cfs yeah, totally. and there's thousands totally. of people they're probably yeah. gonna help you out so yeah no no and i, and I agree it, it's summer I, flows yeah but i'm just saying like hey let's make sure we're discussing summer flows. i wouldn't call that alone either like i because there are people around but they don't they're not having an eye out for you though they're not yeah. watching for all your people yeah. and like yeah. it's it's definitely a lot better than going and running the south fork whatever on a day where no one else is out there in the middle of winter but there's still some you know like don't assume those other people are keeping an eye out on for you yeah all right <laughs> let's move on because willie bum bum set us up for the next one no <laughs> you guys know what i mean we just have, you guys know what i mean right I'm trying to keep the number of words minimal. No right? drinking. So no drinking. No drinking. Do not you drink. You guys know what that means. No fluids. That means. And there's a lot of people who drink and boat, as we talked about, and they say, well, I have my all my friends drink. And I'm like, cool. Correct form is not to combine drinking with white water. 
I need to, I have, I have responsibility as an instructor to let you know that you shouldn't be drinking while you're on my water. But smoking's okay. <laughs> I, um, oh, that's interesting. You know, I should change it to say no drugs or alcohol. Yeah. That would be a, I, I think, I think that'd be clear. Yeah. Hey, yeah. when you're, when you're, when you're boating, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Every yeah. decision in the wilderness requires. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, but not everybody has risk management experience to make those decisions. So, you know, we, you know, that's what we're sort of, that's sort of what we're, we're trying to teach a little bit is some like risk management in our courses. But, so if you're you're saying if you're a in this category of a class two boater, yeah, you should not you should not boat alone. I totally yeah. agree with that. But but then, oh, I'm saying I class five everybody, boater shouldn't boat alone I, too. I think, I'm not saying I, anybody should boat alone. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was just for class two. Once you're class three, you can start drinking on the river. I thought that's what this meant. No, 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 no. What this is like the base level. If you do these things, I'm gonna say you're. I'm gonna call you a class two boater. I'm gonna check you off. Say you know what, Th this list here is basically like a safety talk. If you look at it, it's essentially a safety talk. So if you I can do these things, if you're, you're a class, I'm going to say you can handle class two. If you're a class three or four boater, I would say you could run a one boat class two trip safely. Dougie, fresh. Right. I'm Doug's not going to say a little reckless. Me. Doug's getting a little reckless here. No, no. I'm going to say you can. I mean, along with Peter's comment, you can make a risk management. Not safely. You're right. And uh, you can. I'm not, I'm not, not going to, but I'm not going to approve when people come to me and say, Hey Zach, can I do this? Like, I'm like, I don't know, I guess. But if they ever say, I'm going to go, can I do, can I boat alone and have a beer at 10 AM? I'm going to say, no, that's not responsible. Yeah. And so I'm basically, okay. Just to review for this list, basically we're saying everything in the class two list also applies yes. to class three, class four, class five, everything yep. in the class three list applies yep. to class three, class four, class five. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Okay, so let's go through the rest of these pretty quick. Where's Where your PFD helmet? helmet? And the helmet, I know, is something we talk about. So we're not going to, I don't want to dive in that thing again. You, but you believe that they need to be wearing a helmet on class two? Rowing. This is mainly rowing, by the way. This this list is because we teach rowing classes. We don't teach. Rowing class two, you need a helmet? Oars. Or the most dangerous thing is oars. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's best practice. Give it a break. Yeah. <laughs> Proper dress for water and weather, wetsuit, dry suit, whatever you need to yeah. wear. That's obvious. Shoes are big. I think people underestimate the value of, of good shoes to protect your feet and grip. I think I think we've discussed this, but I'd say I'd argue on some trips your shoes are more important than your PFD in terms of having oh, the right come ones. Come on, that's ridiculous. Well, everyone wears those local ones anyway, so let's not even get started there. But like not that you don't need a yeah, PFD. But it's still and 16 not pounds. 16 pounds is way better than zero pounds, Aaron. No, I'm not saying not having one. I'm saying like, oh, this PFD versus that PFD. Like you could have one of those stupid old orange PFDs on, you know, the ones that go around your, your neck and you clip around you like that type. And I think on certain trips, you, you'd be better off like with that and a good pair of shoes than a junky yeah, pair okay. of shoes and a cool life jacket. So. <clears throat> um, I agree to that. Uh, good comment. Best practices. <laughs> I'm not sure if I agree with that. I don't know if I agree with that either. I mean, how it's do you quantify experience and judgment? Like, it's not like, like once you once you're really good, all of a sudden you can cut the corners. No, like, hey, if I'm a class five boater, it's cool if I'm drinking on the road because I'm a class five boater because I have a lot of experience and judgment. It's still drinking and it's still cloud your judgment. <sighs> I would agree that there are times where you can, like, like for your do not boat alone, I feel like I can manage the risk and boat, do a one boat trip on a class two river. And that's straying from best practices, but I'm, I feel like I can use my judgment, but that's, I wouldn't say that you, you leave all best practices behind as you gain judgment and experience. I think Beck, I would almost say your best practices are going to be changing. And they're not, they're not the same. They're not exactly the same. And I'm not even calling these best practices. This is just a checklist we use to like work on what people need to learn to advance from thing to thing to thing. Best mm -hmm. practices is like almost a whole other thing. But I think, I, I think people with experience and judgment 
to choose not to follow best practices. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm going to say that's not okay. Like just because exactly. you have a let's, let's talk about like, like the, here's an example. Never throw a throwback from a raft. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I feel like that's what he might be talking about. Stuff like that is like, these are the best practices. Never throw a throwback from a raft. Well, we all know of situations as you get more experience where it would make sense to throw a throwback from a raft. And so like the nevers and the always types of things mm -hmm. become less and less, less and less black and white. Well, it could be talking about one boat trips. And so I think I'm going to say, I, I, I'm not, first of all, I don't, I'm not condoning one boat trips in any way, but if you were to do them, I would think you would want to be two grades below your ability level. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. I mean, you want to be just spot, like not yeah. even have, I wouldn't say just one grade. I mean, Ooh, yeah. I'm excited about some comments. We got to get okay. some more comments here. There's but, some really good but comments. Like, let me, let me just say one thing. Like, uh, if you're like a class four boater, I mean, first of all, who calls you a class four boater? Maybe you're a class five boater. We don't know who, who defines you as a class four boater. And then there's class three is a shade of difficulty. So like, <laughs> can you do easy class three or like pretty solid class three? It's not like, you know, there's class four rivers and class three rivers. Like they're on a shade of challenging, uh, high tops. Yep. Smart. All right, what are we going through here? Oh, yeah. Is this the one you're excited about? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah come on, Zach. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Zach. Let's hear uh, it. Uh, best practices, Zach. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and not only you do it, you have your guides do it every trip. Speed boating also on the Rogue is, is a one-boat trip, Ooh. essentially. Mm -hmm. Speed boating on the Rogue, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So pretty much every day Zach's main river trips are going out, there's someone boating alone is what we're hearing. That's a good point. Yeah. But I think I will say, having said that, I think the sweep boat is a unique craft. And it's a little bit of a unique situation. And we're not doing it in high volume, high water, which is what we discussed before, the high water scene. I mean, you're not going yeah, to I mean, really have water. It's Are sort you? of like the South Fork thing, not quite, where there's people around. So if you have a problem, <laughs> but as a sweep boat driver, you're out there by yourself. You could smack yourself on the head and get hurt, hmm. and people wouldn't be around. Uh, but, or if you, I mean, my my biggest scare with the sweep boat is when you're stuck on rocks and you're pushing it, and for some reason it gets comes over the top of you and crushes you, and you're crushed underwater. Yeah. That would be the scariest thing to me. Yeah. But, I mean, I think. I mean, we're, we're, this is interesting because this gets back to Rick, to Rick's thing here about you know best practices or what you follow. Like, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to this thing. Like, people shouldn't boat alone, and we're gonna teach that, and we're gonna instill that in others. I'm I'm not perfect here, because I I have boated by myself a couple times, <clears> and, I, and we do send boats ahead to camp sometimes alone. So like, I'm not perfect here, but I'm certainly gonna encourage people to do it because you need to look at the data, like. People are yeah. dying from in single boat trips. The, the, I don't think anybody's ever died on a speedboat on the Rogue that I know of. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody has died riding a sweet boat alone. This is a really famous story. I think in a heart attack, a really famous sweet boat driver in like the sixties, I forget his name, died on a sweet boat <laughs> by himself. But hmm. yeah, I know this is a controversial, but <laughs> I wanted to be clear. Like when we're teaching people to row, I, I want to give people like, hey, this is something you shouldn't do. Now you may choose to break this, but I'm I'm not going to encourage it. So Zach, do you have your your guides run like Blossom alone? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Even with things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I think. I think. Yeah, you can get yeah. I don't understand his comment. Can you explain that comment? I don't understand it. I mean, with an experienced group, even with having people in class five, you can get hurt, right? So like, why not boat alone? Cause you're going to get, you can get hurt doing class five and we haven't got the class five yet, but, um, Oh, you know, okay. I think, I, yeah. I see what Peter's saying. You're, 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 you're trying to mitigate the risk. I'd say it's like, it's like you can drive without your seatbelt on too. And you're probably fine with it most of the time. 
But why not drive with your seatbelt on? You know, you increase yeah. the level of safety dramatically. And like Zach's point is like, yeah, you, can you get away with voting by yourself? Probably. But if everyone voted by themselves, we'd have a lot more deaths on the river. Yeah. And and I just like look at the data, like look at the white. we could open up right now. I'm not going to look at the white water fatalities. Single boat trips are a major like it, if you look at it's a it's in a lot of the fatalities always like I, I haven't looked at it in the past six months, but I'm sure if I open it up right now. I have, a th- I have a theory on this too, Zach. I think there's another reason why. Because it's a dumb idea. The trips are doing it. Everyone's like, no, I'm not going. And so they're going on it by themselves. And it's not a good day to be out there in that place. Yeah. It's like everyone's like, no, I'm not doing it. Uh, maybe you guys have this. I've had some calls from some friends like, hey, you want to go run this? And I'm like, no, that's a terrible idea. The flow is really high. That sounds scary. No. They're like, oh, if we can't find us, we're just going to go on our own. Mm, okay. So. And, and I just... I just know of enough examples of fatalities and trips, people going out boating alone to where I'm just like, ah, let's just avoid it. I'm going to, I'm going to preach it. That's, that's and I, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Those boating alone situations, are those on like, are they on rivers like the middle fork of the salmon and the rope? Or are they on more? No. I mean, the ones that come remote. to mind are like the click attack near here. There's almost like every couple of years, it's continuous white water. It's cold. <clears throat> every couple of years, somebody goes out by themselves and nobody ever told them not to boat alone. Yeah. That, like, there was never part of their education. So for me, that's part of an education is to learn that. Now, if you choose to break it for some reason, you at least understand you're taking a risk. But they, they chose, they, they chose to do this thing that they weren't supposed to do. But if they never learned it, that's bad. And so that's why I teach it so early in our our curriculum. But I'll, I'll and I'll say like. I've run one boat trips on the Tuolumne, and then what I've done is just hopped on and, hey, can I call you guys down through Clavey? And then we got down through Clavey, then we go down and have lunch, and then we kind of hop back. We would kind of wade for them above Grays and hop back and kind of follow them down through. And I think there's things like that you can do to mitigate your risk and be like, okay, like we're talking about like the harder stuff where you're like, hey, I'm more exposed here, and I don't want it to be a problem is, is by going with other people. And the same could be done. Like on the Rogue, I'm sure your guides do this a lot. Hey, there's someone else sweeping, you know, someone else running ahead. They're like, hey, let's just run down together through Blossom, you know, and, and that, I bet that happens a lot. How often are they at Blossom and no one else is there? I'm yeah, there's typically, there. I mean, I think typically somebody there. <laughs> I think the key thing here is like, if you're an experienced boater and you're choosing to boat alone, you're also setting an example for others who might do it and they shouldn't do it. And so like, if I've ever done it, it's not something I'm going to go post on social media and say, hey, I did a solo lap down the wind. I'm going to go do it for myself and not tell anybody, right? I might tell my wife, hey, I'm going by myself. If I, if I don't come back, here's where I'm at. But I'm not going to come brag about it. I think a lot of people brag about it or they just – they don't know the dangers and they get themselves in over their head. Um, so never take – I leave my PFD on the flat water on the rogue um, and Dustin – says avoid the never um because they're aaron even made a case to me one time like there might be an example you want to take your life jacket off for safety i forgot what that case was or was that no dustin you did was that dustin? somebody was that, remember there was that guy we had on who was all about take, teaching people to take their life jackets off yeah that was that was insane but like <laughs> dustin gave me some example of where like if you got i can't remember got caught under pfd on a pin maybe you'd want to take it off i don't know um yeah i mean that's living dangerously how do you mean single person how do you say that i can't read this is there you saying solo person or one boat i'm gonna say the one boat the more people creates more victims so if you flip and that's more people that are victims I think it's who the people are in your boat too. I think it's one thing if your two guides are two in a boat. It's another thing if it's you and someone who has zero experience on whitewater, or worse, you and four people who have zero experience on whitewater. Then if you do flip, you have a lot of people to take care of. You know, like if I'm with another guide and I'm in an R2, I'm pretty comfortable. If like something happens and we flip, we'll, we'll figure it out. It might, might not be fun, but we'll figure it out. And it's not so Mike, super this crazy is, high water. Yes, sir, go ahead. This is going to take us down a path that could take another hour and a half. And this has to do with speed boats on the Rogue. <clears throat> and first of all, I want to be really clear. 
I do not like sending speedboats on the road. It is not something I want to do. I think it's, I, I'd rather not do it for the reasons we've talked about. But because of the way that camps are assigned on the road, which means they're not assigned in any possible way, we have to. And the reason is a small group of like one to four people takes a 20, 30 person camp. And if we don't send a boat ahead to secure an adequately sized camp, we'll be camping in the bushes every night, all summer long. And I was with Doug just a month ago when we floated by Taiyi, which is a 30 person camp with one person post up in the middle of that camp. And he got naked while we went by. So like, because people, one person, and he waved at us and said, where are you guys camping? It's exactly what he said to us, like rubbing it in that he took our 30 person camp. So because there's one to six person groups all the time taking these large camps, we're forced to send boats ahead to secure an adequately adequately sized camp. And I know a lot of private boaters are saying, no, you just go get the best camps. No, we don't. We simply want a camp that fits our group size and we can't camp in the bushes. And we could have this debate forever, but I want to be very clear. If, if there, if the BLM could do something about the camping, which they have a, so they have plans in place. Like they've researched this hard. They could do something where, the, the campsite competition system was alleviated. I would love to not send these boats ahead for 10 reasons. I'm not going to get into right here. Mike, I'm guessing that's what you were alluding to. So unfortunately I can't because of the way the system is built. Yeah, Zach, thanks for sharing that. That's, that's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's helpful for people to know what's going on there. I could go into this forever because I've worked on this for 10, 15 years. I've been to a million meetings about it. I go into it forever. Yeah, so in the Tuolumne, if you're a class five plus boater, I get it. But there's a lot that can go wrong and there's no hiking out. But the Merced depends on the flow. High water Merced, maybe not, because you could flip and go for a long swim. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I don't know. Well, <clears throat> I think it depends on the run, but the general. The I'd say it's safer to have them in your boat as a passenger. Yeah, yeah totally. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we could be seeing some people one boating the click attack here real soon. Um, I've heard That's, it's dangerous, but I don't have any data. I've, I've, yeah, it's interesting. We had some talks about this and like, it's not as dangerous as people think it is for some reason. And I don't quite understand why, but if you're wearing, I think if you're wearing the life jacket, I think it's the no, no PFD is the big issue. Yeah. Is my understanding. I feel like just like getting a hole in your dry suit, people always used to be scared of that because it yeah. could fill up and drag you down. But really it's just, it doesn't take, make you that much less buoyant to have a little bit of water in your dry suit. I think though we talked about this, a while what happens is it increases the mass of you yeah right so yeah. it doesn't make you sink but aaron you helped me come to this realization you all of a sudden you have all this more weight so you're carrying yeah. as a person a couple hundred pounds of water and so you're gonna have a harder time swimming to shore you're gonna float the same but moving your body to where you want it to get is all of a sudden gonna be way yeah. way way harder exactly yeah so <laughs> that's what i mean falling in you're not gonna just drown from that it's, it's gonna be a lot but, harder to swim to shore yeah but i would add to that um fishermen comment fishermen don't wear like if they're standing on shore and waiters they typically don't wear mm -hmm. life jackets and man a lot of accidents i have a friend that passed away that way oh, really? in the ocean a wave came in and he took him oh, out geez. and he he was staying afloat fine he had his he put his fly rod in his mouth and just started swimming towards shore and next thing you know, he went down because the waiters just kind of pulled him down and he never came up again. So, yeah, wear a life jacket, even if you're standing on shore. Yeah, Mike, we've been working on this for at least 10 years. <clears throat> BLM has an amazing study in their hands on how to fix it, but they're not going to change it. They're just, they're a bureaucracy that just, it's, it's hard to change. Write them a letter. You should write them a letter. Say, hey, you, they need more and more and more letters saying, hey, the camping system's not good. We've 
worked on this for years and years and years. And every year the outfitters write letters saying you need to do something. We don't care what you do. You just need to do something. So the more letters they get, the better. And can recognize hazards, but objective. Hmm. Can recognize hazards. You mean can read obstacles? Can recognize it? What are we talking about? I think, I Whoa. think. That's yeah, a lot yeah. of words. Yeah. Objective would be like obstacles. And he's saying subjective, like. Um, voting alone or yeah, oh yeah, cold weather injuries or I mean, Dustin, that this this is gonna go in the fifty page document that includes clap. Um, so I'm trying to keep this short and simple and in words that people understand. Objective and subjective, maybe most people understand it, but when I read things like that, I start dozing off. Can recognize? I think that's that's a little bit of null speak. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely null speak. And Dustin is an old person as well. Yeah, Mike, we weren't gonna camp on top of that naked dude. Like he was you could tell he was not gonna welcome us. He You didn't want the, you didn't want the eight year old kids hanging out with the naked dude. The yeah, this was a trip. this is a music trip. Like it was it like it would have been really weird. But he he you we couldn't pull in. We could have pulled our boats in, but his camp was purposefully set up into where you'd have to hike through and where the kitchen would go. So like we could have camped on him, but we we knew Wildcat was downstream, it was open, hopefully open. And so, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's not realistic. It sounds like a good idea, but it's not realistic. Um, all right, let's keep moving down this list. We're doing good. So, um, and river yep. signals, like to me, these are, I'm going to call these the primary four. Like these are the basic ones. You should know. What's, some the, what's, the, go, what's the go signal? What's stop? Or this, or this, or Eddie out is also stop. Go could be like this. It depends on like your group, of course. Like go could be like arms up. I think ready to go. you know it's funny is we talk about you know this being this being stop. stop, and I think this is by far the best thing to do. I think that's way more universal in the river world. The Eddie out. Yeah, I, th I think that sometimes you need like like there's a, a you see a, a rapid up a stream. And you're like, oh man, let's get everybody Eddie out and scout. There's that, but there's also like, oh, there's a tree. Boom. What does this yeah. mean? What's it means? No. Four? No, what does this mean? If I, if I do this, you can't you... stop. Yeah, I don't know why that's not stop. Well, you can't that's see stop, it from, stop everywhere else. You can't see it from upstream as well, but this is very like this obvious thing. from upstream. That's why I use this. So when I teach stop, here's what I teach. I go, I use this when I'm close quarters. Okay, stop. I use this when I'm far away. I might use this but if I'm medium length, but people confuse this with first aid. And this eddy out means the same thing as stop. And it depends on the context and what you're doing. But, but like you could teach something else. Well, stop is the one that you need, I think of all of them, you need to have a communication with their group ahead of time to be like, Hey, what are we using for stop this week, guys? Like if you're boarding with a new group, like what, what symbol do you guys use for stop? Cause it has, it's the most confusing one. Well, and I think it's important between groups cause that's the most important one to tell another group coming down top of you. Hey, stop. True. It's true. Oh. Okay. Let's move to class three. Um, so we're starting with um, technical skills. And so, like, class three boaters can ferry back and forth across the river and catch eddies. You with me on this? In class two water or in class three water? We're class three. These are cla now we're class three boaters. This is yeah, I know, but yeah, I'm saying is is like I feel like a class three boater can catch eddies and ferry and do all in class two, but in the middle of class three rapid they can't. But a class four rapper can do it in the middle of class three rapid. Yeah, but to be a class three boater, you you have to have. The ability yeah, to the ferry ability and catch eddies. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And then pulling away from dangers. And this is uh, this is important to our philosophy of teaching rowing, which is like a lot of people learn, like guides, guides teach, especially push, 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 push. And we're going to teach to point at a danger or align to danger and pull away from it. So we're going to focus on the pull stroke first. So I'm going to say the, the pull stroke needs to be the foundation of your boating uh, when you're a class three boater. If you can't pull and you only push, you're, to me, you're not a class two boater. You're just somebody who boats. All right, move on. 
can swim towards a boat or shore. So you have to be able to do, do some sort of self-rescue. Can't swim towards, can't even, not even expect to be able to get themselves back to the boat or to shore. You have, at a minimum have to be able to make progress towards shore or the boat. That seems it's a class little weak. Three. It's class three. Weak. Hey, you're oh, a water polo coach, weak. so you, yeah. No, oh, I mean, I mean, you should be able to swim to shore. If you're running a boat down class three, you need to be able to swim yourself to shore if your boat flips. Yeah. You can swim towards shore. You, you, can't, you can't just be like, because this is telling me, oh, I can help facilitate my rescue, but I don't need to be able to rescue myself. And I think you need to be able to get yourself back to the boat. I Okay, climbing the boat, that's one thing. Be able to swim back to the boat or swim to shore. You have to be able to swim to shore. You shouldn't be guided yeah, classes. Right. Towards to boat or shore. No, it says towards. It depends on the to shore. Swim if you're in the Grand shore. Canyon, the swim shore is half boat. a mile away. So, like, you, it's... it's this is a basic mm, level. Yeah, I think you're, I think it's a little. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not that happy with that one. But okay. Um, really, pump pump. The IRF signals. I, I wish they were universal, but like, I think this is a signal for. Are you okay? If I remember right, like, when I teach an IRF course, I have to go remind myself the signals. They're, we don't use them as a. They're just not. They're not generally accepted amongst boaters. So if I used IRF signals in the real world here in the US, people would be very confused, unfortunately. Willie Bumman, this, this, this list is for private boaters. So this is, this is, we talked about this at the beginning. This is the checklist we use when we're, this is the foundation, the one page or foundation of our private boating instruction. Like, so it, which is a good question because if you're a guide, you definitely have to get this. You have to get to the shore, boat or the shore. If you're a class three guide, you can't just swim towards shore. You have to get there, right? So, Aaron, I think you're thinking about guiding too. So, I'm thinking about a private boater. They go ten yeah, times a year. They have I'm to at s- least make make. And you know, go go out and look at everybody on the road. Go watch a road. Go go sit by the road one day and ask yourself if 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 that person fell out, can they swim to shore? If that like. Half the people on the road could not swim to shore. Yeah, they can. They can swim to shore. But I, I will say, I, 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 I'm going to say this. I think this, for paddle boating, if if you're taking your friends paddle boating, you need to think of yourself as a commercial guide. You know what I mean? Like, you need to have the same level This isn't for paddle skill. boating either, Aaron. This is for I know, rowing. exactly, exactly, exactly. I agree. I'm just saying, I just want to clarify that. This is for rowing. You're rowing yourself. You're not responsible for other people in your boat. Once you put other people in your boat, I think it ups it a bit. Like you, you, your, your skill level needs to be higher because you're responsible for others in your boat. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, if you're, you're right. If you have people in your boat, you have to be able to swim back to the boat or shore. So that's why. So in class three boater, I call this person the participant, right? Like they're, one row, one person rowing and a team of people rowing. They're not in charge of anybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're a mm-hmm. participant. Yep. They're rowing up with a bunch of other rowers. Yeah. Right. Totally. There's no leadership here. It's just individual, individual skills. Um, can recognize rap potential. Basically can see a rock that could wrap a boat. Like it's like you can see a, a dangerous place. And in class three, wrapping is one of the more serious things I think that can happen. Um, understands hy- river hydraulic and river my for river understands hydraulics and river morphology. I had to rewrite this one because people weren't happy with me just saying river, whatever. I guess that's the official term, but you know, like understands waves, holes, mm-hmm. helical currents, all the things. Um, good scouting etiquette. Like you understand, like to wear your PFD in your helmet, to carry a throw bag, all the stuff. Um, you have flipped your boat back over. You've actually done it. Which honestly, Aaron. Wait, 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 wait. So you've actually done I'm, that thing. You've actually done a reflip. So you climbed on top of your upside down boat yes. and flipped it back over. You've done it once. You've at least get, been through the process of flipping your boat back over. Have you climbed back into your raft after you flipped it back over? Nope. Nope. Okay. So this is this is a very low standard. <clears throat> this is assuming people can help you get back in your boat. You have a, a some sort of like ladder to get back in your boat, right? But you've at least done it, so you have familiarity with it. And so people, you know, all the time 
we have people in our classes all the time that have never done this. And we, we ask them to do it in the class and they don't want to because it's cold or whatever. I'm like, cool, we're not going to approve you as a class three voter. I'm not going to approve you until you've actually been through that process. Um, where's PPE? And it's PRE, so wear helmet, life jacket, shoes, all the stuff we talked okay, about. Okay, well, isn't that already in the – why do we put that again in class three when it's in class two and it's inclusive? Um, it's just reiterating it because it's so important. And we're adding the understands PRE, which is personal rescue equipment, which which is uh, could be a variety of things. But I'm going to say that's like a flip line, maybe like a CPR mask. Maybe you want to have pulleys and stuff if you're a super ninja, that kind of stuff. So it's just a little more advanced. Like you wear your stuff. You're not like one of those people who takes their life jacket off in pools um, on the rogue. Oh, and if you maybe you have a wrap kit in a little dry bag next to you, you understand okay. personal okay. rescue equipment and you have something for rescue, you understand what it is, why you have it, and where is that. We have let's give us a couple of comments. Um, That's the who next wants to one. take this one? What, what one exactly? You put the daisy chain on there. Why is the daisy chain important? Okay, let's talk about the next one. Uh, so these are the knots I think, like, I think the, the critical knots for, for boating. Are bowl and water knot and figure eight. That's just my opinion. So those are the ones I teach. They cover a wide variety of rescue situations. But somebody had me add daisy chain because you don't want to have like long leader lines people can get wrapped up mm -hmm. in. I, so, I, I, I I totally agree with that. Actually, is like you don't always have the right camp, the right link cam shaft for what you need, or the right link piece of webbing. And yeah, you don't want those long tails hanging off. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I gotta figure out how to do that, Robert. Um, let me think about that. I gotta think about how to do that. I'm happy to share this publicly. It's, I mean, well, obviously, but it's, it's, where do I put it? How do I do it? That's the tricky well, part. Well, can you just include, you, you gave me that Google doc link. Oh, uh, where do I, do I put it on a website somewhere? Do I, I don't know. It's on, I mean, we have an online rowing course and it's in there and it's part of the free part. So if you go to whitewatereducation.com and you go to our, here, I'll even pull it up right now. Should I pull it up right now? Yeah, show, show people where they can find it. That's a great idea. Hold on, I gotta remove this though, hold on. Um, I'm pretty sure it shows up here. Education. So whitewatereducation.com is our online rowing course that costs money. And all of our courses, we have all of our lectures um in whitewater education here so okay, there's it. some amazing comments today this is this is like we have yeah. got we always have good comments but today is particularly good there's some really fun ones today you guys are you guys are you guys are doing a great job you're taking us from mediocre to a little higher <laughs> with, with your, your comments they're phenomenal just incredible comments today i'll get i'll get to them so if you go to our rowing course curriculum it shows all of our curriculum all the lectures we have there's a ton of them and the ones that say start, you have to pay to see, but all the preview ones are free. So if you preview the Wildwater Skills spreadsheet, there's a talk about it, and you can see this spreadsheet here. Where, so, is it, where are you? Can you show where to go to that? Oh, am I not sharing this? Oh, hold you're, on, hold on. you're just on the homepage of it. Hold on. So Wildwater right, Rowing Course, <clears throat> and then you can see the curriculum here. And the preview ones are all free. The start ones, those are the ones that have to pay the 400 bucks to get the course. But if you click on preview the this one, um, and you go down the skill sheets right here. Okay. Oh, yeah, thanks, yep. sir. And I just remember that. And and there's a bunch of free courses like behavioral hazards, why environmental hazards, PPE. Um, there's a really good one on um, recognizing hazards here. The river signal one, which I actually updated today. Um, pulling from danger. You know, there's a bunch of free ones you can see. So if you want some free lessons, there's a bunch here. Um, all right, let me get out of this and that and get back. Let's go to back to me. some more amazing comments. Zach, okay, that's a pretty sweet site. I like it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hate to be judgmental, but I mean, yeah. Class three butter, scared of everything. Class four butter, hardcore. <laughs> Class five. Actually, never been voting before. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I like that. That's kind of true. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Good point, Rick. Mm -hmm. you, you like the comments because there's one that agrees with you here, and that's why you like the comments. No, no. I actually, I, that one, that one's nice, but I really like the one before about class three board, better, 
scared of yeah. everything, class four voter, hardcore, just ask them, class five voter, <laughs> acts like they've never been voting before. Well, I don't know. Uh, sure, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, tying up the bowline property, what does that mean? Is another... Oh, uh, like tying your bow line. So there's a bow, oh, bow line. line. And yeah. Bow yeah. Line. yeah. It gets confusing. Yeah. The bowl in and the bow Include line. It in your video's descriptions. Include it. Oh, the P it's hard. you can't put a PDF in a in a description. That's the only thing. But it's but I Robert, I showed you where it's at. All right, so let's go back to this thing here. No skill sheet. So I mean tying okay. up your so we're at can't tie these knots. Tying up your your bow line is an important knot. Um, but everybody does it differently. Like I'm not gonna call that critical. You know, you have to be able to do that to be a class two voter because some people stuff in the bag. Some people don't have one. Yeah, but I, I, I think that's I'm actually I, I'm, I'm going to go with Gornick, Gornick. I'm going to go with Gornick because I've seen Again, too many bow lines come undone I'm with while rafting. Right. I'm and with I you. I think just... having a good like that's more important than the others. There's more. I've seen more dangerous scenes because of that. Because no. people don't tie a water Wait, knot or a you, figure eight on a bite with a fall through, blah, blah, blah. So the reason this one's here, the water knot and figure in a bite, because we're putting like very basic rescue in class I, three. We're like I, setting yeah. the stage for class four. So I understand the value of this. In the 50-page document, tying up the bow line is in there. But to keep this short, like we're assuming people ha can do it. And it kind of that kind of lives under can tie boats to tree rocks on shore. That's a good point. So, yeah. so can tie yeah. your you're boat. Right. You're right. Okay, you're right. You're right. I'll give that to right. you. So like I mean. a skill is you can, when you get to shore, you can tie it up. So you know how to do some knot, probably two half hitches on a bite. And as part of that, it's bringing the rope back in and tying it to your boat, however, or however you can do it. Some people just have a boat, a rope bag, whatever. I'm not going to get into how it's done. Um, experience the accurate with a throw bag. Like you have to be able to use a throw bag, right? Um, understands their equipment. And so this is the thing we see a lot in classes. People buy stuff, but they don't understand like how things attach or why that bolts there, or, you know, they have a lot of equipment failures. So that's on there. Able to repair raft. However, you are going to choose to do that. And then some sort of first aid knowledge. So that's class three. All right. Let's see what Lily Bum Bum says. <laughs> People, many of us trust immensely. Uh, this list is, is it judgmental? Wait, wait. A large percentage of great private roads are stoned. Oh, oh, oh. For every river so mile. Actually, actually Willie Bum Bum, on this list, it doesn't say that you can't be stoned. Zach's thinking about adding to the list, but just to be clear, that's not on the list currently. You just can't be drinking on the river. You can be stoned currently per this list, but that might change. So, um yeah, Willie Bum Bum, I'm going to say I know a lot of great photos who get stoned a lot too, but the really great ones I know when we're running hard stuff are not stoned. And I don't, I'm, yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to think of any of them that, no, none of, none of the ones, I don't know anyone who would get stoned before. This isn't sure. meant to be judgmental. This is meant to create a foundation of education for people getting into boating. So, you know, just because you can get stoned. <clears throat> And boat down the river doesn't mean somebody learning can or should be doing that. So, I mean, it's like, you know, if, if you were a guide for 10 years and you've done class five and you do the rogue, you can get away with a lot of stuff. But it doesn't mean you should be doing that. And that's not a good example, in my opinion, for younger boaters. Right? It's not best practices. It's kind of like having a beer on the river. I put in the same guy core. People do it, but it's not best practices. And I, the goal here is to set like a, a, again, this is a one page foundation for what I define people as levels of boaters. Now your friends, if they're like class five NAR boaters and they just happen to get stoned, I'm not going to be like, you're a class one boater because of that, but it's not good for them in my opinion. And in the, in the way, and at least the way we teach, um, lots of people use daisy chains. Yeah. And tying them as part of tying them. Again, that's part of the 60 page document that has every detail of everything to do. Once you're past class two. 
I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, I got to add that in. I got to be more. Sp That's in the 60 page document. Okay, let's keep plugging away. So we just finished class three. Uh, let's move to class four. How do we do that? Boom, class four. Who wants to read these? Doug, go for it. Yeah, I'll read it. Sets example for other boaters. So it's just, a, to me, it's a leadership just thing. Conscientious about that you're mod role modeling certain behaviors. Yeah. Yep. Can read the river and use features. So this is just a reading water element. Like you can s basically read water. You have some sort of reading water thing. And you can use holes and rocks to make maneuvers. You're not just like being analytical about. So this this compares over to class three. That's like um, can ferry and catch eddies. You can do that. Now you can add to that, you know, reading the river and using different features to move around. Yeah. And that probably, yeah, I don't see, I saw scouting on the class three list, but it's not here. So that could apply to scouting too. Like during scouting, you can, it kind of explains yeah. scouting well, or that you have an ability to scout. Can push aggressive moves. This is, the, and this is to me the biggest one. So in class three, we talked about pulling away from dangers. And the foundation of our boating is like the pull stroke, which sets us up slow time down. Class four boaters still use the pull as their like foundational technique, but they know that there's some aggressive moves that they can can push through. So Aaron, you gave me a funny look there. No, no, no. I'm I'm reading ahead. I'm reading ahead. So, okay. And Zach, when you say aggressive moves, technically aggressive or requiring a lot of muscle aggressive? I, you know, the big thing for me when this comes up is laterals, like laterals you have to break through. Yeah. So you, if you pull and try to ferry th across the laterals, they just get you back in the middle. So sometimes you need to square up and push through laterals to make an aggressive move somewhere. It's, it comes up more, but the goal is like a lot of people who boat a lot, <clears throat> you know, they, they, they push, 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 and they teach push, push, push. And I think that gets boaters in trouble. And I think the yeah. foundation needs to be pulling. And then pushing is something of an option to do as you yeah. need to make more aggressive moves. I guess I would say if somebody is very, has great finesse with their pulling, maybe they could pull that aggressive move that's, that you're talking about rather than requiring the muscle to push it. Yeah, that's why it says can push aggressive moves. You don't have okay. to push it. You can do it. We introduce pushing in class four. We okay. talk about it in class three a little bit, but we really focus on pulling. In class four, we're like, hey, here's another tool. I'll try this sometimes in Rapids. Okay, next one. Can quickly recognize dangers. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Next one. Physically fit and strong swimmer. So this okay. is your swimming thing. Like class three, you can make progress. Class four, you have to be serious. You have to be legit. That's good to have in there, I think although I'm definitely guilty of not always being fit. Um, understand how wraps, flips occur and how to avoid them. That makes sense. Can stay in a boat, can stay in boat order with proper spacing. I like that one. That's pretty huge for me. I think like, like we always talk about boat order is sort of second priority, but I think spacing is always number one priority for me at least. Um, the next one is aware of downstream safety. Can we so stop back on? Can we go back to the boat order thing? I feel like that should be a class three skill. Like if you're participating, you got to be able to hold boat order, don't you? Yeah, um, it could be. Yeah, I just think that in the class three world, you're just focused on yourself. Like how do I get this boat downstream? Class four is more of the team mentality. Yeah, and so I, I, would, I would say the spacing more like maintain proper spacing and that's a class four skill but class three you should you should be able to hold your order in general like you should be able to maintain order yeah your spacing may not be the best at all times but yeah, yeah i think anybody can hold boat order like go third anybody okay i'll go third um aaron i think i would say just the opposite of what you said i said a class three boater should be able to know how far they you know at least have knowledge of how far they are from the other boat and where they maybe where they should be if they get out of order, that's okay, but they shouldn't be right up on that next boat or let that next okay. boat get too far ahead. Yeah, I'm with that too. <clears throat> yeah. I agree. 
Yeah, Zach, maybe move proper spacing to class three. It's up to you. I mean, that's, yeah. um, OK, next one. Um, aware of downstream safety. What do you mean by that? This one's massive to me. Like, um, whatever boat is in the lead is exposed. And so if they have a swimmer, that swimmer is going to take off. So just aware what happens if a swimmer gets ahead of the group and do things to keep the swimmer from getting ahead of the group. Got it. So a good one is, you know, you know, having the second boat close to the first boat in case the first boat flips, the second boat can get them. Uh, if you're running a big rapid, maybe having throw bags at the bottom in case the first boat flips. Uh, just if don't put the don't put the boat with tons of people lead because that's more exposed swimmers. Like maybe put the gear boat first so that if they flip, that's only one swimmer versus seven out of a paddle boat. So just being aware of like what happens if the lead boat has swimmers and keep swimmers from getting ahead. And if uh, and given all that, have use safety kayakers and cataracters when appropriate to provide good downstream safety. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wonder if you could say something like, maybe change the terminology a little bit, like whatever, whatever other thing you want to say, but manage downstream safety or uh, to me, it wasn't super clear, but yeah, I see. I mean, saying. a lot of this stuff isn't meant to be like, it's meant to stay short. We're trying to keep this short. Yeah. I, I so in the 60 page document, you know, like, and by making it, you like, you don't understand what it meant. That's awesome. Because now I get to explain it. Yeah. Okay. But I'm teaching somebody and they're like, what does this mean? I'm like, oh, let me tell you. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Um, expert with a throw bag. What's the difference between expert and experienced and accurate with the throw bag? What's an ex expert? What does an bag. expert throw bagger do that an experienced, accurate throw bagger does not do? They're better. What is that? What does that look like? How do I know I've reached that level? You don't. The point of this is like <laughs> as a class three butter, you have to have some some ability. And as a class four, you have to have more ability. This is better. A skill you whatever, you, whatever, whatever you were, it needs to be better. Zach, if you I agree, I'm with Aaron a little bit on some of these. They could be specific. Um, just to help the reader clarify where they are, like able to hit a two foot by two foot target. That's in the sixty page situation. document. Well, Again, it's not that long, though. That's all. Yeah, one no, you come come here, Dougie, and you work on this, and we'll talk. <laughs> like trying to get trying to get an entire, basically, philosophy of a rowing <laughs> curriculum from class two to five on one page. Okay, you don't want to get specific. Your goal is to not get specific. Yeah, it's on one page. There's a lot of information here. Yeah, and the sixty page document, it's there. I'm going to say this, Zach. It would be really nice if you hyperlinked all these to where where the information is on the sixty link sixty page document, so I could just click on it. And then it takes me right to there on the 60 page document. And then I could read up and learn more. Did I talk so, about our online with, rowing? Did I talk about our online rowing school? Have I talked about that yet? <laughs> okay. Um, can we flip and get back in the boat? So this goes back to what you were saying, Aaron, like in class three, you've at least gone through the motion of flipping your boat once here. You can do it. Mm -hmm. You yeah. actually can do it. It's not just like you've done it once. You can do it. Competent team member in rescue. Master of their equipment. Cool. And this compares to understands their equipment in class. You're like, yeah, I understand it. I know where my stuff is too. Like you know every in and out of your equipment. Like I have a urethane <laughs> boat, which means I have to use this thing and my frame is steel, so blah, blah, blah. And you know every detail of your equipment. Got it. Brings group safety gear and first aid gear. So, yeah. That makes sense. So what we're teaching is if you're a class four voter, you, ha you, you have that stuff and you bring it. If you're a class three voter, eh, that's your option, but it's part of being a class four voter. Let's get to some comments really quick. Hmm. Yep. I mean, I don't know where to put that. I feel like that's it. It's important. In terms of you, the way that I see your curriculum, it seems like it'd be four, but um, like I think of a group going out that's doing a class three river, somebody has to do that talk. So 
you should be ready to do that talk. I'm going to say, from what I'm reading from Zach, I think the person who's leading that group down the cluster river really should have class four skills. You want someone in that cluster group to have those class four skills because the class three is just the participant. They're not the leader. Well, They're the, the well, the example. class five I talk is the example, really. So ideally, you have somebody who has the class four skills, the class five skill set. And so the way this is built is you can be a class five boater, but never boat class five. Like there's a mentality of class five boating that's providing leadership for others that I'm going to call a class five boater, even if you've never done a class five. But I think like if a bunch of class three boaters go out boating, and they're all in this level. They're all in this class three border level. Well, there's no rescue experience here. So if a rescue has to happen, it can't be done. And people can't get back in boats necessarily or swim to shore that well. So you sort of need to be, you know, to go boating class three, you need to be a class three boater sprinkled with some class four and hopefully maybe even a class five boater yeah. in there. Oh, good. Well, he bum bum like that. I first cool. read that pushing it in quotes. I was like, oh, Willie Bum Bum's not going to like this. Yeah, I can see that, right. Nick. You can see that. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that would be something. If there's something that isn't on there that we want you want to include, that would be something you bump off. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I, I try to do like a progression. Each of them had, there's a progression of reading water. There's a progression of hard skills. There's a progression of safety. And there's a progression of... Um, of, uh, of equipment and so you can see it, they kind of build every time it goes from like you know where's pfd and helmet to <clears throat> oh, to where's pp has understands rescue equipment and understands their equipment to all of a sudden carry safety gear and is a master of their gear so it's like there's sort of a progression in terms of equipment that goes through all this I mean, Sean, this is an issue, and this is why people tell me they they boat alone. They don't have people to go with, and in my perspective, boating is a team sport, and so you have to. That's the hard. You have to find people to go with. I'm going to say this: when you find someone who says yes and is willing to go and drop everything and alienate, you know, relationships and whatever, you hold on to those people tightly because <laughs> they're hard to find. They're like, "Oh, I got this this weekend." You're like, "I yeah. want to go paddle." And you definitely, it's hard to find those people who are committed and have the ability to get, get away. And I think, you know, Aaron and Dougie, you're people who, you were, we were a crew in college, you know, and we still boat. I mean, Dougie and I still go boating here and there. Aaron, you're in Hawaii, so we don't get to go with you. But if you lived here, we'd still go. So we, we have, and we have a crew of like people that we learned with and we, we still boat with. We're very lucky to have that. Um, and we've done some harder rivers stuff, I would say, is class five, potentially. Um, but I don't really boat class five anymore because I don't have that crew. I want to boat class five. Like, let's go. I have all these things I really want to do that are really hard, but I don't right now have that crew to go do with me in a way I feel good about. So I'm going to choose not to do it. Right. So I'm, 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 and I, I'm kayaking a lot right now because I have a lot of kayaking friends right now. So like, I think we have to, in a lot of ways, boat with the people that we have, um, yeah, I think I think it's a team sport, and it depends on people and finding the people. That's why there's you know there's clubs to join, where there's people that are going, um, online forums. But I think finding a crew is one of the hardest parts. And I had a great discussion with a really good boater the other day, and he's trying to build more class five boaters because he has nobody to go with. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, you when you're when your friends move on, you're left by yourself. And maybe, and that's the problem with class five is it's not just your skill, it's the group skill and also their cohesion. What do you guys think? Yeah. I think, I think okay. that's why, that's one of the big reasons I started kayaking because it was hard to get people together to go rafting. It takes more in general and you just yeah. have like one friend and two of you can go kayaking. And it's just like, okay, let's go. And so I'm to this day way more comfortable in a raft than I'm in a kayak, but there was a point where I was kayaking a lot just because it was an easy way to get on the river, a much easier way. And, and I think that's, it's tricky. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's always hard to find people to go and, and 
it's a it's a commitment to go paddling for a day in general where most people live to get out get out you know not everyone lives where you yeah, or a out. week just, or like or a, a, week, a yeah. south fork of the salmon trip you know yeah. if, if the, the water has to be flowing and you have to have a crew that can all go and they trust and they're they work well together um but to do it i'm just gonna say to do it safely to do it responsibly you gotta have a team like just because you can't find boaters doesn't I, I, my opinion doesn't make it okay to go by yourself. That's just me preaching, and I'm sorry for doing that. Uh, we have a lot to catch up on here. Oh my gosh, what's going on? Um, we're both spacing. Yeah, yeah again, that being a 60 page document, like again, putting all this on one page is super hard. Um, of course, Station knows something about it. Yeah. And, and Rick, this is like, this is my, my big thing. Like there's a lot of people out there that they're doing class three that have like a class five mindset and skill set, but they don't have to vote class five to be class five boaters. In my opinion, they have to, but they have to have that mindset. And I go boat class five sometimes with a bunch of cat boaters. And I see a handful of people that don't have half of these things. And, but the people that do have these things we'll get to in a second. That's who I, identify with. I, I go, Hey, you're, I like you. Let's go boating next week. And so these are to me, the class five skill sets, um, that you need. And, and if you're that class five boater, you're a super asset to that team of class three boaters doing the class three. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sean, 100% North Fork American. I wouldn't do that alone. South Fork. Would you guys do it alone? South Fork American? Yeah. Well, I have done it alone numerous times. There you when go. we say alone, we're talking one boat trip, or are we talking alone in December when no one else is on the water? Um, yeah, judgment. It all comes down to judgment at that level, level of temperature in the air and amount of water in the river and how many people are in the water. How I'm feeling that day. Yeah. yeah, have I even bought a bunch? But an but important saying, thing to me, well, Andrew, get to your question in a second. You'll look at class four boater as the example, and class five boater, the first thing is able to set an example and speak up when necessary. This is where, like, if you're a class four and five boater, you should be setting a good example for others. It's not just about you, it's about the example you're setting for others. So if you go solo <laughs> boating, you're not setting a good example for the people who are like class two boaters who don't know better. I don't know so if I, I don't know if I buy into that all the way. You should, Doug. <laughs> I mean, they could see in you a good boater that's using their judgment to make decisions about what they can boat alone, and that's a complicated Ooh. thought. I understand, but um, just because you're, they should have better judgment than that. They shouldn't say, "Oh, Doug's going to go run that by, by himself, so I can go do that by myself." But. I, I think that this is my opinion, and I know people disagree with me. I know you guys disagree with me. People shouldn't boat alone. It's just a thing people shouldn't do. But if oh, you're going to do oh, it, I, I, I agree. I agree, Zach. I agree. If you're going to do it, don't don't tell others about it. You're setting a bad example. Just do it. Do it for yourself. Do it for the solo time. Do it for whatever reason. Don't do it and post on Facebook. Okay. I did a solo lap. Down blah blah blah. To me. That's not setting a good example for it. It's generally a bad habit. And again, yeah. look at the data. Look at the fatality data. You'll you'll yeah. change your mind once you look at the data. I'm 100 percent with you on that, but I don't I don't do that on social media anyways very much. I did I did the click attack this summer twice, one boat trips. Uh -huh. Um, you know, with with a bunch of newbies in the in the raft too, like <clears throat> even some kids sometimes. You're a class um, two boater, Doug. You're a class so, one boater in my mind now. Yeah, and I mean that's. I felt like I was able to manage the risk fine. Like I was not concerned about that. And I think that's appropriate. But you were doing, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give, I'm going to give you some pats on the back and some tough love. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're Doug Weedwald. So you're, you know, you understand you're Mr. Knowles, you know, all that stuff, you know how to manage risk. And it was, if I remember right, the class two section of the click attack yeah. at low water. Yeah. So well below your ability levels. Yeah. But I'm going to say the dangerous thing is there's wood in that river. 
that you yeah. weren't a hundred percent sure there was no one in that river. So if there was a river wide log in the wrong place, you could have been in a lot of trouble. Yeah. That's a tough love. Yeah. I hear that, but that's part of the risk. I mean, but you're taking a risk for yourself and the people in your, you're, you're taking on the risk for the people that went with you. You're yeah. saying, Hey, trust me, I'm Doug Weedwald. And I, but I feel appropriate taking on that risk in that situation. Like that's not above my level. And I'm saying, but do they I don't, I'm not going to advertise do, that. Do they know the risk they're taking? Yes. Um, do they? No. Do they I know there's a one in 10,000 chance there's a no. log in the river? And if there is a log in the river, there's a one in a hundred chance. It could be a serious problem. So they're taking a one in a million chance. Going no, they're whatever. like a commercial passenger, essentially. They're... They're not, not well, commercially. They're, we wouldn't run that trip. I know, but I'm saying that the passenger, the person, the people I took were essentially, uh, yeah, mm -hmm, incompetent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Would boaters. you run a one boat commercial trip if you owned an outfitting company? Hey, Doug, would you send out a one boat Knowles trip? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you'll take, you'll let your friends do that. You'll take your friends and family down. Yes. I mean, <laughs> class two, hey, where I feel like I could manage the risk. And, you know, the second trip was only a few days after the first. Of course, I had seen it. And that's when I took the Once kids. Once you've seen it, I'm going to give you a little bit more leeway. But yeah. um, it, it is, it probably was warm. It was low yeah. water. You're Doug Weedwald. But I want to I want to point out that right now I'm trying to be a class five boater. I'm trying to set an example and speak up when necessary. I'm trying to speak my opinion. <laughs> okay. When I feel like it needs to get out. I agree with your reservations about boating alone. But Zach, it says non-judgmental of other boaters is the third one. And I feel well, like that's, about to hammer me. that's about to hammer me. <laughs> hey, um, let's get on to Andrew's question. Uh, uh, we have permit issues. Like it, our, what we do is not. Like we have permit issues with a lot of stuff. You just call me, we can figure it out, but probably not because of the way that the permits are set up. It's yeah. just hard to do that kind of thing. You know, Andrew, this is an interesting conversation. We've had, we've had conversations off the air. This we've had after the podcast or whatever, after the, after the show shows where we just sit and talk about some of this stuff. And this is an interesting one that we, Zach and I have discussed before, because there's definitely, it's too bad. There isn't a space for that, for, for people to be yeah. hired to like, like, like more like a mountain guide, you know, like they guide you up, but you're also doing the climbing. Like you want to go boat, like on a normal commercial trip. Now that's not going to work well. No one, you know, the, the, the commercial offers don't want to deal with that. And it's too bad. There isn't a space for that. Like on some of these rivers, like the Tuolumne or the Illinois. Well, I get calls on the Illinois specifically, but the rogue a lot too. Like, Hey, we want to do the rogue or private boaters. We want to pay a guide to come along and just help us do it safely. Yeah. And unfortunately that's illegal. You can't pay a guide on a private private permit, right? So that's really it. Really, is too bad too that there isn't a bad. space the space for that where like people could get checked off and go through go through and just be like come along and like bring yeah bring my own food. like I I would do that bring my own food bring my stuff go yeah. along and just be like yeah I'll help you guys get downstream. It's an area that just can't isn't served in the way the permit system is set up. It's just unfortunate, yeah. and that's why we offer our class three and four schools so that we can help people get the skills they need to do this. And so that's why we do so much education. That's why we do these courses. That's why we're on YouTube. We're doing this right now to hopefully share with people information that we have that might help you do your trips more responsibly. That's why we built the online rowing class. Like we were trying to help people uh, get knowledge that we, we think we have that helps you. Maybe our knowledge is terrible. Who knows? We think it's good, but it's why we're doing all this stuff to help people be able to do these trips. Um, let's move on. I don't do class five because the only people I trust to be capable on it, I don't trust. Okay, yeah. So the people that are class five boaters, you don't trust their decision making. Yeah, yeah, that's big. Um, yeah. I mean, ah, see, I don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't. I mean. <laughs> Okay, let's 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 apply that analogy to let's apply that to like backcountry skiing. So you got to go get caught in avalanches to learn how. To, no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, have some. It, it does work. Sure. No, it does work. Think about the Roger Lee guide schools. They would just go eat shit, and those guides were 
the people that came yeah. out of Roger and Grant schools were solid. You're you're yeah. taking a larger chance. You're learning. I mean, I mean, yeah. That's kind of how I learned too, Aaron. Like I went out and just like pushed the limits and came got in trouble once in a while. Like go out, see stuff go down. You're rolling the dice because yeah, I think there's that that is a way learned, to do it, but yeah. I don't think that's the good way. That's like you take the kid to the top of the ski hill and say, "This is yeah. how you learn to ski black diamonds." Let's go. Take your swim. Yeah, but no, but you're better off, you know, like, hey, let's stay on the green runs until you can until you can ski parallel and you can skid your turns and you can hockey stop. But Steve then isn't. Steve isn't necessarily saying don't do that. What you're saying, Aaron. Yeah, he is. He's saying, He's saying go, this is how you get going out with the guys who eat, 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 they go out the guys who go down and like, them, like we're going for it to learn and they, they eat it and they learn through the process. I feel like and they get better saying. fast and they, that's how you get experience. I mean, if you just do class I, two all the time, you never get experience. Mm, yeah. I don't. I don't think you get better that much faster. I think. I, I think there's something to be said for some of that in terms of the feedback and definitely <laughs> guide schools. We do take them on some harder runs to have some more feedback, but I think you can learn a lot. By just trying to catch every eddy on that class three run. Oh, yeah. And like and just That's... going and bearing everywhere, catching every eddy, going every single spot on that run that you can. Yeah. And when you I can't agree. get any more of it, you're fine. You'll be fine yeah. on the class four. If you can do that, yeah. that really tough eddy there, you can catch that eddy. you can catch the eddy halfway down Charles Maker, ferry out, go around the rock, go over here, catch that eddy. You can do all that stuff, catch eddies going down meat grinder or you know, and the other class three runs like that. Yeah, then you're ready. I mean, I think you can do it without going out and just getting beat down. I, I agree 100% in my older age. In my youth, we wouldn't have got beat down a lot that way. But as Dougie knows, there's a rapid right now we're running on the White Salmon where I'm catching 40 eddies in one rapid. Every time I do it, I catch 40 <laughs> eddies. And they're like micro or, eddies. You're, oh, you're, come on, you're full. There's 40, 40 eddies. There's 40 eddies. It's a long rapid. Okay, okay, Zach, how come we haven't seen – we've seen so much footage of the wind and we've never seen you catch the 40 Dude. eddies. Done. I want. I want like, yeah, we gotta see some footage Dougie, of you tomorrow. The 40 I, we're going I know out. that. I know that you do that one where you do five on each side, and then right above that you do a bunch more. There's a ton up there because you actually you put in yeah. you go upstream and you attain some eddies. Oh right, right, right. I mean, At the, okay. By the time I, I get to you in that rapid, I've caught like 25 eddies. Yeah. But they're like there. A lot of them are easy eddies. They're like. <laughs> There, there's there's 40 eddies in this rapid. Is this even a rapid or is this just like flat water you're paddling back and forth across? It's with a, like a no, little, little a bit of courage. This is not like a rapid. Here, I'll show you. That. Hold on, rapid. hold on. I'll show you. I have footage. Oh, right geez. Now. I have because I had this for something else. You've got the wind footage. You've got wind footage just available, ready to go at a moment's notice. No, it's on hey, the way. Well, because no, I was going to, we were maybe going to talk about our, we were maybe going to talk about our warning today uh, because Peter Gonzalez sent us his video and I was going to show some video of me our warning. It's this rap. It's this rapid here. See all those eddies? I've already caught ten eddies at this point. There's an eddy right there on the left. Eddy on the right. Oh, did we do this eddie for the, the left? Eddy on the right. There's eddies all the way down here. Zach, is, did we do this for the IRF course, or is this a different section? What? Did we do this for the IRF course? Quieter. See, how, the, at uh, this point, I've caught twenty-five eddies. Okay. There's all kinds of just, and then I all right. I want to see the footage of you can catch, catching 25 eddies in a kayak. So this oh oh, stuck oh, here oh, oh 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 in a kayak, not, a raft, not in a raft. raft. I thought yeah, we were yeah, talking yeah, in a raft. No, I, I could probably catch that. eight eddies in a raft. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that makes yeah. more sense. Let's. We got a lot of comments. We're getting way behind okay, our sorry, comments sorry, today. Sorry. Um, where are we at? Um. People raft above their skill level. Seems um, to me many people, especially raft guides, raft above their skill level for sure. Well, I think I that's know. how some people think. I think there's a lot of people with the mentality that's how you get better. Is you got to push yourself to get better. You do need to push yourself, but I think it's over. Like we talked about skiing, over train under terrain, and I think that's 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 not used enough in the rafting. Is over train but easier terrain. Like, don't go for the hard white water to get better. Like, really work it on the easier stuff. Yeah, Dougie, mm -hmm. here's a friend. Sweet, Willie Bumba, <laughs> man. Yeah, yeah, you guys can. Yeah, commercial passenger with no insurance, but they're trusting you. I'm not sure what that means. Um, so Jeffrey. I, mean, I think it's a thing. Um, 
so uh, on a private permit, you can't, it has to be co shared cost. You can't pay anybody. So like that, that keeps private permits from becoming commercial permits, right? Cause if you could, if, if it wasn't shared cost, commercial companies could just get the private permits and then charge you money to go on the private permit. So it keeps the private pool basically like legit and it's supposed to be shared cost. As soon as you pay one person, that's a guide and, and the BLM, what'll happen is that if the BLM catches the guide, they'll lose their license to guide from the state and all the equipment will be confiscated. And so it's, it's a way to keep private permits legit. I have a nice so, article about that. Yeah. yeah you can get really get sure. hosed. Yeah. Is that, which SK is this? Is this the, is this super Kev or is this some other SK? Uh, was, yeah. That's the thing is that people like would love to hire somebody to go down to Illinois. I mean, honestly, like, if you had five friends that wanted to go to Illinois, you couldn't pay me enough to just go along and help you guys. Cause I don't know anything about you. Like it, it would scare me. Like, I don't, I don't know how to, as a single person, be responsible for five people. And I know what can go wrong and it, it scares me. Um, so I, I don't know how to handle that. You know, we, you, the only way you could do it is, I mean, we're, our Illinois trips are sold out for next year is to, it would cost you a ton of money to book like enough guides to have, have the right ratio to do it. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's a hard one. There's no, I, 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 on the rogue, like if I was one person with five people, I could, I could show people down, edit them out, talk about things, but the Illinois not knowing your ability levels would scare me personally. They, they, yeah, they could, it would just cost a lot, like a lot, you know, depending on what they want to do. And honestly, Zach, you're not that excited to do that even with your commercial trips because you've got rig, you, you've got known quantities when people sign up and you have your guides take the craft down versus this, like, yeah, I mean, it's easier for show us. Up. It's honestly easier yeah, if people are just regular raft people who like are on vacation because, um, it's just easier, but we love doing this. Like we do this all the time. It's just expensive. It's at least the cost of a normal trip. Like you think like, Oh, we'll do our own food. We'll save money. It's, it's going to cost more because we have to put extra safety on. Cause we just don't know your ability levels. And like, let's say you make a mistake and get hurt. Do we, evacuating you is hard. How do we, if you get tired, how do we deal with it? Like there's, we've had a lot of issues, so we have to be really careful with this, unfortunately. Um, oh, we're lost. Tried to run. I don't know what these are referring to. Experience is some mistakes, but you're going to be dumb. You better be tough. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. That would be scary. Yep, yep. That's a good choice. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know, you do know there's those people where you're like, ah, those guys need to get beat down. You know what I'm talking about? Like, there's some people who are just they're super cocky. They're running big, big stuff all the time, and they've never been beat down. Sometimes you're like, they need to be humbled. I think that's what he's talking about. I feel like I've seen a lot of people get humbled though, and then kind of walk away from the sport. Yeah. And that's an issue. Yeah. Like, I think that's pretty common. Like, if you go into the sport and you charge, <laughs> charge, 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 eventually slamming is going to happen and you're done and you never do it again. And that's where, like, what Aaron's talking about ski the terrain or whatever, or whatever you're saying is ski the thing over like, terrain, terrain, under terrain. Yeah. Like, go do things like class four and do class five moves mm -hmm. in class four and enjoy the sport. Yeah. Don't, it's not a contest who's the more badass. Like, it's about getting out, having fun, looking at birds, having hanging out with Dougie, yeah. about friends <laughs> and nature and all that stuff. It's vague and needs. I'm not sure who we're talking about. Is this, this Super is... Kev? I'm a little worried. No, Scott, this guy's name is Scott. Oh, okay. The drink question's vague. Yeah, probably um, old school there, if you know yeah. that one. Yeah, a lot of really good boaters have passed away. Yeah, and I'm going to say it's – some people are talented, but they still don't have that base of experience, and it, and it catches up with them at some point. So they can get away – I feel like people can get away with stuff, but that, that lack of experience, you'll see it. And I've seen it with commercial guides who are like, oh, man, this person's a natural. But then all of a sudden they get off plan A in certain spots, and they just – they don't have the experience to, to be able to jump to here or jump to there, and then – Things, things fall apart for 
um Zach, yeah, great com interesting comment. Well, I, I, you yeah. do see a lot of cap voters get themselves into trouble, and, and I yeah. think get overconfident. There are definitely th that group of them out there. I mean, there's some I mean, cap voters who are incredibly skilled as well, but yeah, it's the same thing with kayaking. Seen. Like modern kayaks are so much easier to paddle than old kayaks. That like really old, yeah. Aaron, if you got a new kayak, like you, you would paddle. You'd be like, wow, I'm. It's amazing. You're saying it's so, so my why my why is old school. Like I got why, a new one. Your why is beyond here. old school. Yeah, you're white. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you're white. It's definitely old school. Get Maybe yourself an OG or a. They, or they're a, a lot more comfortable now, too. Yeah. That's the main Ooh. thing I found. Yeah, Jeffrey, the premise system is super. I could go on it for hours. I'm not going to. But um, yeah, it, it's just, it's trick. I know what you want to do. We ask it all the time. It's tricky. We love doing it when we can, but it's <laughs> hard to do affordably. And we have a lot of comments we got to catch up. Um, well, welcome back, Scott. Yes, that's the good thing. And honestly, like the Illinois is a trip that like, if you guys go out and paddle some hard stuff and get better and I don't know where you live, but like for us, the wind is a great place to practice for the Illinois. If you and your buddies, if there's three or four of you, you have work well together, you're a good team and you wouldn't have done on your own. It'd be such an awesome adventure, you know, to just figure it out on your own. What a, what a cool trip. Just go in the flows are moderate and there's not rain in the forecast. Wow, that's cool. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we've a, we all have a handful of friends that don't vote anymore because they had a beat down, and it's just it's happens. Huh. Yeah, the Kern River is brutal. All right, let's get through class five. Let's do this pretty quick and close this show up. Yep. Who wants to read? It? Aaron, you should read this because you're the class five man. <laughs> oh, all right, I'm the class five man, huh? Um, able to set an example and speak up when necessary. Yep, we talked about that. Great communicator. Yep, I think that kind of goes with our first one. Non judgmental of other voters. Clearly, none of us are class five voters here on the show. <laughs> we lost our class five voter card with our judgmental comments about everything we see. Um, I think it's being open and, and understanding it's a process. You know, and I, I think I think I, the, the the gist of what you're saying is there and should make sense to people. Is that what you mean, Zach? Or what do you mean by yeah, just like people? being cool with people? You know, I think I think we we know judgmental voters who are you know just like taking a step back and kind of just like somebody else suggested that I add this. This was wasn't my original skills checklist, and I liked it. It's just like you're just you're cool to people, you know, and you're you give them a chance and <clears throat> you know, no past judgment. Don't give them, if they oh and if they flip. Just be like, hey, you flip, man. That's fine. Let's move on. You're good. Right. And actually, I think most class five voters that way because it's not a big, they know it's not a big deal. Most of us have flipped multiple yeah. times, and we know our next flip is just around the corner. So yeah. there's no reason to be like, oh, you know, hey, you tune in. It's like, yeah, it's going to happen to me sometime. We know that whatever you just imitated, we all know that that voter, right? Where yeah. it's like, hey, we're out here to have fun. Like, you made a mistake. Hopefully you learn from it. Let's keep going yeah. down river and have a good time. Yeah. All right. I, I like this next one. Is in complete control and can, can catch all eddies and class four rapids. Yeah. I think that is, you know, like it's kind of what we talked about is that when you can catch every eddy in class three, you're ready for class four. When you can catch every eddy in class four, you're ready for class five. Can you use any equipment? Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Like can you wear or locks, raft or cataract? Throw me on anything. I got this. Yeah. Is keenly aware of group safety. Yeah, is aware of location and amount of group safety and first aid gear. Yeah, I mean, I mean, most of this, a lot of this is big picture stuff we're talking about. Can determine boat order for the group. Can make good decisions about running rapids. Can give good advice to other boaters about rapids. I think that's a key one there, Zach, is is like the leader, the class of guys, like is giving good advice, giving the right amount of information. And, and that's one aspect. The other aspect of it is is giving them the right support that they need on the trip you know like like a good trip leader is like it's like when someone does flip or something like that a good a good leader is someone who's able to get like you know get that person to move on. like hey i had a flip and, and dougie comes up and is like hey Aaron, blah 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 and i'm like oh 
helps me shrug it off and just move forward and get focused on what I need to do. You know, I, I think that's, yeah, you've got to be a good leader if you're bringing people down and help them just like understand what's important, what to be focused on, help them prepare for rapids and help them let go of a bad run they had in the past. And just like instill, help instill confidence in themselves and see that they can do it. I think that's a key part too, is like believing in the people around you. And if you don't believe them, you shouldn't be on the water with them. And you shouldn't be encouraging them to come with you if you think they're not going to do well. Yep. So, uh, calm and stressful situations. I like that promoting calm. Yeah. Can quickly reflip and get back in a boat. Yep. Proficient in all swift or rescue situation. Yeah. Like you've seen it before. You've been there. Totally. Okay. So I'm gonna, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, one big thing about this to me is like, again, it's not that you've done a bunch of class five. Nothing in here says you've done class five. It, all it says is, you're in control and can catch all it is in class four rapids. If you can catch all the it is in class four rapids, in my mind, you probably have class five boating skills, <clears throat> but the, the, the skill set is really about being a leader and looking out for the group. That's what the class five mentality and skill set is for me. I, but I think you have to, Zach, there is this 10,000 hours component to this though, is you've got to put some time in. Yeah. But like, you can't like you catch can't, all rapids, all that is in class four rapids without the 10,000 hours. Yeah. Like that's going to be gonna be, in Yeah. That's going to be right. the limiting factor. Like if you're going to, if they can go run the wind, let's go run the wind, right? We'll go have fun. You can get down the wind and you can say, I ran a class four plus, but until you catch every eddy on the wind, you know, that, that we're not, I'm not ready to talk to you about, let's do class five. And it's going to take a long time from just physically getting down the wind to catching every eddy all the way down the wind. To me, that's a test. Like that's like if you can, if you can just do every ferry, every eddy catch, drop every little thing, then then you have this. That then you may have the skills to run harder rapids. What do you think? Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah. The, hey, Andrew, I, I the only way is my favorite trip. It's an amazing trip. I'm guessing Aaron would say the same. Yeah, Peggy, I don't know if you've ever done the Illinois. I've never done it. Wait, yeah. is it? What's your favorite trip, Aaron? Oh, I have like my top five, but the Illinois is. I, it's hard to say one over the rest, but I of would course. say I, I, if I were to choose one trip to do this next year, I'd be pretty damn happy if it was an Illinois trip. And I don't think I'd be like, "Oh, would you want to trade for anything else?" I'm like, "No, no, no." Like, like, yeah, get to do an Illinois trip next summer. I'd be very happy if that, if I got to do that. So I, I, it's a, it's one of those special places in the world. And it's kind of like the secret little trip, you know, it's, it's, I, it really bums me out is that we can't provide more support for people who want to go do it. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I, I, I love for more people to see it. And I mean, the, the yeah, but in, trips are so limited. In some ways that's good because it, I mean, part of it, what makes the Illinois special is you don't see, you, you rarely see other people. It's like an untrammeled canyon. It's like truly <clears throat> wilderness. And so the fact that there's such difficult rapids, it limits the number of people that can go there. Otherwise, it would be tramp more trampled. And there's not enough campsites. Yeah. I, I don't ever think that's going to be a problem either. So I don't think that you're going to ever see that much usage. So go try going on a Friday sometime when, when it's. The weather when it's sunny and the flow is twelve hundred on a Friday. I've never launched on a Friday. Actually, yeah. I don't know if I've ever launched on a Friday because almost all my trips have been commercial, except for that first trip we did when we were at Davis. You guys weren't on that trip, but I wasn't on that trip, no. And I don't even remember we we launched that midweek too, actually. We didn't want to launch that one. I don't yeah. think we launched that one. It's on getting Friday. busy. The Illinois is getting busy. <clears throat> um, but on weekends, like if we launch on our commercial trips on Sundays, we never see anybody. But if it's like a Thursday or Friday or Saturday, it's getting to be a little bit too busy down there already. So I mean Good point, Big Bertha. I forgot Illinois does suck. No it is. It's, 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 you know what? It's cold. You know, yeah. the rapids are mean. The there's poison oak mean. everywhere. Yeah, there is poison oak everywhere. There's, there's, I've there's seen shuttles really long. Aaron, you know that one waterfall camp on the right? Um, there's rattlesnakes everywhere there. I've saw, I see two rattlesnakes per trip there. At the, at the yeah. waterfall camp on the right below, below Greenwall at the canyon. Below, yeah, below Collier Creek, where there's those two yeah. waterfalls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, camp the dual waterfalls. I camped there with you yeah. once. Yeah, um, yeah, there's, totally. there's a rattlesnake den in there. It's awful. Oh. Um, some private boaters do have zero rescue skills, and some are 
rescue squirrels and they can rescue anybody and they love rescuing people. So, um, yeah, I think, um, SK part of what we're trying to do is promote more rescue skills through videos like this. And we're not actually doing rescue skills, but hopefully we're talking about some of the things that help and encouraging people to go out and practice their knots, um, things like that. Um, oh, I'm flipping up like over. That's there crazy. Um, yeah, to me, the wind, to me, the wind is an amazing training ground. It's where I go practice to get in shape and work on my skills. North Fork American in California, Tuolumne, Cal Salmon. Uh, there's, you need a good class for training ground, but place to practice. And I think the wind, the wind's good, close to me, my favorite. Yeah, thanks, Denise. See you, Denise. So it's been two hours. We were going to watch a couple of videos, but I think it's probably time to shut this bad boy down. Sounds good. We'll have to save it for next week, yeah. Let's save it for, save it for next Sounds week. Sounds good. Um, do we have anything else to talk about, or should we – oh, well, let's get to the poll. Okay, here's the poll. Do you, The question was, do you think people should drink on the river? 32 votes. 31% yes, 69% no. Two thirds think we shouldn't, and the third think we should. Yeah. Yeah. Thirty one one third thinks people should drink on the river. They didn't say should. The question was should people not drink on the river? They no, don't the think people is, should Do you think people should drink on the river? And I wrote it kind of yes. quickly. Thirty one percent thirty one percent said yes. We should be drinking. We should be drinking. Uh, yeah, yeah, I should make that drink alcohol. I'll I'll we'll try to do a better I mean I wrote it really quick. We'll try to do a better one next time. Right. Hey Zach, the wind might come in this week. It, it's we're in the massive storm, so maybe freshy now. I'll go out and do the wind. Yeah, and then we'll get some wind feathers. I can't tell if you guys are making fun of me or not. They are. Okay. <laughs> when it says wind or we riot, that's making fun of you, Zach. Okay. I think they still well, enjoy it, but be careful yeah, what you ask for because wind season starts this week, and that's all I'm going to have is wind footage. All right, so. <laughs> If you guys haven't hit that like button, Zach, how are you doing on, on your followers? Have you gotten to where you want to go yet? Are you feeling good about yourself yet? I'm not quite at a million, but we're getting there. Where you know, if you, get, if you get 100,000, you get a plaque from YouTube. Wow. And what are you at right now? Almost 6,000. <laughs> so I have a long way to go. So what was that, 94,000 94, to go? Yep. Just 94,000 to go. 94,000 more. Help Zach get there. Help Zach get his plaque. Um, we'll be back again next week on Friday. Are you guys going to be doing a show on Tuesday? We are. The Tuesday show is just where people – I get. A, I'm starting to get a lot of questions like, what size paddle should I buy that I can't answer by email? And so we're going to answer them live online Tuesday at 2. And we only have one question so far, so um, it might be really quick. But we're, we'll do All it right. on Tuesday. Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. We'll be here Friday, next Friday. If you guys have footage so we can avoid the wind footage, that would be great. Everyone's been paddling this summer. Um, you can send it to me, Aaron, at riversandoceans.com. Um, and then, yeah, make sure you like hit that like button and, of course, subscribe. And then ring that bell so you get notifications anytime Zach puts anything online. Um, I wanted to thank Doug. Doug, thanks for joining us. It's always yeah. fun to hang out and talk with you. And uh, you guys, uh, great comments this this today it was really fun it was a this yeah. is a really uh, fun show today so thank you appreciate it and dougie don't forget you don't have to hang up when i'm done because we'll talk yeah. afterwards all right, all right. Get ready. <laughs>